listening to the House by the Video Store podcast. Welcome to the House by Video Store podcast. I'm your host, William, and joining me today will be Derek. Hello. And Sean. Hello. And if you're listening via the audio podcast and iTunes or wherever you find that, we also have a video version available for this, which you can find in or on YouTube. And in this episode, we'll be discussing the 1988 remake of The Blob. But before we get to that, we'll go through some news and things we've been watching. And there's been some pretty big news this past week with A franchise that's returning with the original director as just the producer bringing a vision to it. And everyone's really excited for it. I'm, of course, talking about the sequel to The Green Inferno that's being produced (laughs) by Eli Roth. (laughs) Is there really a sequel to that? Yes. Oh, God. Yeah, the... um, I don't know. We're going to spend too much time on this. I I saw that and I was like, oh, they're making that I didn't see any news article about that, but I saw somebody talking about it on (laughs) Facebook. So there is a sequel. Well, they said that they're they're working, they're in production on it. And I think there would be a demand for a sequel for that movie, but I have not watched it. I just, everything I've seen would make me Well, just the trouble production, how long it took to get out. Like if I was him, I'd been like, okay, I'm just going to move on now to, you know, to something else. (laughs) Yeah, because I made a tweet the other day from the official our official Twitter, and I was like, uh, yeah, they have to follow up one of the worst post-credit stingers that I've ever seen in the history of oh, movies. Yeah. So if you haven't oh, seen that movie God. yet, make sure, if you have seen it and you didn't see this, make sure you watch all the way through to the very, very end, because there was a credit, a post-credit stinger that like left a few people in my audience laughing, and that was not the intention. <laughs> Let's just say they uh, really like Google Earth. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the actual news is that... Um, because I hadn't seen any like speculation this was going to happen at all. I just saw like a Facebook stream that was live from the Blumhouse Facebook page. Mm-hmm. And Blumhouse announced with John Carpenter that they're going to uh, Blumhouse be co-producing the next iteration of Halloween. That will have John Carpenter as the executive producer and creative consultant. And they're still discussing if he'll do the, the score for it or not. But they are bringing Halloween back. And they said that... I don't think there's and no they'll get it done too. They won't be yeah. like all these other studios that just have the franchise yeah. and then hang on to it for like well, six years yeah. until they have to make one. Didn't a couple months ago, like the franchise get flowed around a little bit because I know they're supposed to be remade and then it just yeah. kind of disappeared. Halloween returns. Yeah. yeah. So in 20, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Cause we had discussed this before and I'd actually written a couple of artists articles. I guess I'll put them in the show notes for this about like how 2016 will be the return of this last year because there's supposed to be a Halloween and a Friday the 13th and possibly a nightmare on Elm street hitting in 2016. And then Friday the 13th got pushed to 2017. And I still don't think there's concrete information on that. Halloween was supposed to be Halloween returns, which I guess they had a script for and it was being directed by Marcus Dunstan who had worked on um, the Saw movies and The Collector and, and some other um, movies. And then that went away. And then they announced at the beginning of this year that they were shopping the movie around at different studios, trying to find a home for it. And then the news now is that they're going to be working with Blumhouse to get it out. There's no story or director or anything attached to it yet. Uh, but I did hear that they want to keep the budget low, like $15 million or less, and make it much more in the mold of the original than some of the later sequels. So... And it, and it seems from just from what I've gathered, it seems like they're not going to go out of their way to kind of make it some convoluted um, plot line that makes it make sense with the story. It seems like they don't. It seems like they're not going to care about um, following up to any of the other sequels, even though this is a sequel and not a remake. They're just going to make a good Halloween movie, yeah, yeah. and not worry about the family line stuff, or at yeah, least like too much of that. Well, you got too convoluted. Yeah. You know? Well, the funny thing with this is, so they, you know, like John Carpenter said, this isn't a reboot or a remake. You know, this is the next chapter in that story. So, but then the question becomes, well, what chapter are they following? <laughs> because this series has become increasingly convoluted when you have the first movie, which is, you know, the original 1978 John Carpenter movie. Then you have the uh, sequel, which, you know, Reveals that Michael and um, Jamie Lee Curtis is Laurie Schrode or brother and sister. And then you have three, which is unrelated and actually has Halloween on the TV as a TV movie that's being shown. And then four and five are follow ups to two. Six, you know, furthers the Cult of Thorn plot line. And then you had Halloween H2O, which only followed the first two films. 
And then you had Resurrection, which followed Halloween H2O. And then you had the reboots with the Rob Zombie ones. So do they follow parts one and two? Do they follow parts one, two, four, five, and six? They mean it's not going to be a reboot of Rob Zombie. It's going to be Rob (laughs) Zombie's Halloween 3. No. (laughs) Or will it just follow part one? Because... But then that's, you know, it, it, I feel like it may be one of those things. that's just out there and it's just a Michael Myers film. It yeah. has nothing and to do with the Strodes, the Myers. Yeah, that would yeah, be the easiest like thing to do. Be the best, get rid of yeah. all the baggage. You know what I mean? Because that's the thing that holds down. So even a lot of these superhero films, they yeah. have all these baggage of things they've got to talk about that happened before. Things they've got to set up, like just make a good slasher. Yeah, because Michael Myers kills people and just have him kill people without some nope. ridiculous plot lines and like, make up some new great characters that you're following and kill, them. you know. Figure out a way to get them together. <laughs> but see here, so here's my pitch to him, and they they won't be able to do this for budgetary reasons. Get Paul Rudd to be the new Michael Myers, and you don't realize that it's him until the very end. And then it's not that he's um uh, Tommy, like the grown up version, like he was from Halloween Part Six. He's just a random guy. He's like, yeah, I just saw on TV. I thought it'd be cool. But I mean, you say that for budgetary reasons, though. But I mean, maybe he can I mean, sign he, on. They yeah, get him back in money. He, he, I don't know how many indie films he's still doing, but he was doing quite a few. Before Ant Man, still, you know. Well, and he did uh, Wet Hot American yeah. Summer, first day of camp for Netflix. Yeah. And I'm sure that wasn't all that lucrative. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, these, uh, you know, this movie, like, it's funny because there's all this conversation, you know, around it online, like, oh, well, they, why don't they get Carpenter to direct? And people are saying, well, for him, it's a lose lose situation because if he directs it and it sucks, it's like, see, he still doesn't have it. But if he directs it and it's good, then it's still going to be compared unfavorably to the original. Yeah. And the only way that he would get universal acclaim is if he makes one that's by far as, you know, as good or better than the first one. And I don't think you're going to do if that. If he pulled the George Miller and like, you <laughs> know what Max I mean? Like, wrote it. like, yeah, just make something new, but also, you know, it has, is rooted in those original films, but make something that blows your mind. I don't feel like Carpenter at this point, I feel like his heart isn't into that, in, into doing that. Though. Well, you know, and it's, like, it's regardless of skill or yeah. what he's lost or what he doesn't have anymore. But I feel like it's probably because he's he's let I feel like he's let filmmaking run the course through him. Yeah. And now he has he's done like some comic book writing with the Big Trouble series, um, you know, making his new, new music and stuff. I think he's just kind of um, wanting to take a backseat to this. Yeah, like him scoring it would be the thing that'd be the most exciting to me because I love Lost Themes one and two. Then apparently he's releasing an album in June that's going to be um, r- new versions of uh, classic movie themes that he has made. And they have a video online now of him, um, like a live version they did of Escape from New York's theme. So him getting involved, at least on the the soundtrack side and you know scoring it, that to me is almost more exciting than him having creative involvement. Because the question is like, well, how much involvement would he really have? Because he's a yeah. c- creative consultant, but he produced the Fog remake and that turned out pretty poorly well, and he also pretty much says as long as you give him money he'll well, let him put his name on yeah and you're yeah. talking about the so, fog that's what i think i told you guys before i was at <clears throat> uh a panel a halloween panel and sean clark was there who's worked on some uh, horror documentaries and stuff and he i don't know he, he travels to like norman Reedus for like show he does a lot of stuff in the horror world and he said he was on the set of the fog he's like in carpet and not give a shit he was like as long as i getting paid i don't care what you all do <laughs> yeah so i feel like with this, he's gonna he's gonna actually care a little bit. I mean, this is like the franchise that launched him, yeah. Yeah. that launched his career, and obviously he cares for it because he left it after part three because he didn't want them to do sequels to it. You know what I mean? I think he, I think there's just something still here that he holds close to his heart, and and the directors lined up as rumored what Ty West and well the so the parent so they did confirm so I saw Bloody confer, uh, Bloody Disgusting confirm that. Mike Flanagan, who directed Oculus, Absentia, and Hush, uh, was in talks with them to direct this. And then Adam Wingard, who directed Your Next, The Guest, some segments in VHS and some other stuff, had um, tweeted, went like a little tweet storm, sharing images from Halloween. Did I just make up the Ty West thing? Because I was talking Ty about Ty West him. is like, so when people talk, so Mike Flanagan's the only one I know for sure has been, like they verified Wait. that he's been talking to them about and it. Yeah, so he did Hush, right? Yeah, and he and did Hush for, for Blumhouse. Yeah. So it makes sense they would talk to him because he also did Oculus, which they released. But, um, you know, Adam Wingard, I think, is kind of a perfect fit, you know, as if you watched the videos we've made, like I did that soundtrack swap of the guest in um, Halloween. Like I think that, you know, that was kind of like a modern reimagining of that type of story. Um, and so I think he would make a lot of sense. And it seems like he loves the movie. 
but then other names like people throw around. There's all kinds of people that always get brought up for these things that are never even been talked to about it. So it's just uh, yeah. speculation. But, you know, people said like Ty West or um, Jeremy Saulnier, who did uh, The Green Room. Some people talked about. I don't know that he has any interest or they've even considered him, but they just throw around names of like genre directors that people like. And, you know, um, I don't really know who they're talking to. I mean, if they get Mike Flanagan, like, you know, I think with Hush, it was a very pared down, basic home invasion type story. So I think that, you know, he could probably pull off, you know, if they want to go very grounded and realistic with it. And boring. Yeah. I wouldn't. I don't know. There, there I, was, I, yeah, there was nothing super yeah. exciting about that film. So I, I, you know, I want something. I want them to amp this <laughs> film up and not yeah. like I, I'm not saying I want him to run. You know, but I, I just want it to, I want there to be some memorable moments in this and hush. There was yeah. just nothing. There was nothing that you pull out of that film that, that has any type of iconic no, moments that, or anything like that at all. Yeah. That was like one of those movies that uh, I've streamed it in my house and I watched it and I got so bored that I was just reading stuff on Wikipedia during it, you know? So like that would be a movie if they, that was the direction I'd say he wouldn't do a good job. It would just immediately make me lose interest because the last movie I watched of his, I was like fast forward and, to the gore parts because I was so bored. Well, know? I mean, like I said, I mean, I think that I would much rather see them. Then I saw some people saying, like, "What about Eli Roth? He's probably available." Yeah, it's like, no, no. I no. don't want him because I haven't <laughs> well, seen anything of his ever that I love. Well, your vote is Adam Wingard, right? Because you love him. Like in terms of people that they're that are realistically in the realm of doing this yeah. now, like people who would be amazing to see what they would do with it. You know, like Tarantino doing it. That'd like, be interesting. That would be... Except there would be a lot of dialogue, and Michael Myers would talk, so we so could <laughs> Michael Myers <laughs> speculates on the theory of life. And, and it would end like up being a, Samuel Jackson's Michael Myers, <laughs> and it would just be the same... And Michael, you know, we, no, we can't do that. No. Like, you know, there's... Like in, like I said, like, out of people that have been in discussion, I would much rather see Mike, uh, Adam Wingard do it than Mike Flanagan or some of these other people that people have thrown the names out for because I think he matches the material. Now, what was something that was something notable that he has directed? Because I think you said, but I can't remember. Adam Wingard, he yeah. directed The Guest and You're Next, which we yeah, did a see, podcast I would, on. Yeah, I'd really like to yeah. see. I liked both of those movies. See, that, for me, be, if, like I told you, I said, the, Ty West, House of the Devil Ty West, like, I think he did a phenomenal job with that. I didn't yeah, love yeah, I the innkeepers that. and stuff, but I think as far as the tone and the, the vibe of that and... If they did do like a almost a a retro throwback film, like modern throwback film, kind of like the Star Wars, you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of films that have that vibe. Like the oh, Star remix. Wars feels like it's like an old film, but it's new, you know. And I think he yeah. could fill that void if they wanted to go in that direction. Um, but some of his stuff I haven't loved, so I think he would be like a risky choice. Well, I think too, like with this movie, so you know, you had the original, which. Halloween wasn't the first slasher. You can look to a lot of other stuff, but kind of like it was the prototypical slasher that started the boom from the late seventies to the mid eighties, just because it was, you know, it kind of laid out a blueprint that people followed and it was financially successful. You have earlier stuff like black Christmas and psycho and other movies. I'm sure I'm missing that, you know, were slashers before the popularity of that genre exploded. But I don't think this one, they want to do a throwback film because we've already seen like just a pure slasher in this day and age doesn't sell very well not that it can't but i don't think a straight slasher i think that the tropes are so well worn that just giving a by the numbers slasher or you know even if you were to release an exact copy of halloween if you did a shot for shot remake of halloween like they did with psycho like i don't think there's enough there to draw the young audiences into no because it. It, so you have to modernize it while slow. keeping what made it what it was which you know i wrote an article about like what i would like to see out of halloween if they make a new one and the thing is, like, so the thing that I love about the original Halloween was it was like, you know, a suburban slasher. It was in the burbs or, you know, going from house to house, walking around neighborhoods. And you don't really see movies like that, that approach that very much anymore. I think there could be a lot that you could touch on, like how much that suburban, you know, life has changed from, you know, the late 70s to today. Because even in the first movie, when Laurie Stroh's trying to go to other houses and knock on the door to get in, people don't let her in. Mm -hmm. So how does you know, how do you work with that in today's world where everybody has cell phones and, you know, smartphones and there's people that are trigger happy and yeah, stand their see, ground? I feel like if they ever had like a movie set in like the South, it'd probably end in like 10 minutes because <laughs> somebody's got a shotgun. They would just shoot him in the face. Movie's over. So I well, think like so you had to set it like in California. That way, you know what happened. Well, it's, I mean, they'll probably keep it in Hadfield, Illinois. I'd have to think. Uh, yeah, they got pitchforks out there. It probably wouldn't last very long. Either. Well, the interesting thing will be if... It turns out to be kind of a traditional slasher that that somehow is like, you know, 
critically um, favorable, yeah. like, which which will be hard to please a lot of the critics, <laughs> I think. You know what I mean? If that happens and Carpenter does the music and everything lines up right and then it's just financially not a success, like that would be the end of slashers in the theaters, I think. Yeah. If, if, yeah, if, that, if that turns out. Yeah, because I just think like... Movies like uh, The Green Room, I think, are kind of maybe would take the place a little bit of the slasher because those movies are a little bit faster paced, still gory. Well, just like genre just, films. Yeah, like a genre, but like a straight up slasher, I can't remember the last time that I've even watched a straight up slasher in a theater. Like, I don't even remember like well, the like, last I think major release of one. Today, there, there's so much genre bending going on. And Netflix and streaming services have also taken those, instead of those bottom of the tier movies making to theaters they just go there because like i'll discuss it in the way we've been watching but there's like i just watched the tv series it's literally called slasher that is a pretty straight slasher so i think that people still want to make slashers but the general audience is because the last big you know much ballyhooed release i can remember of a slasher film was scream 4 in 2011 in terms of like a movie that had a big budget big cast big promotional push and that movie, I think, eventually made its money back. It only made like forty million in the U.S. off, you know, a budget that wasn't much less than that. So they didn't, you know, make much money, and they didn't push forward into a sequel with it because of that. But that was in two thousand eleven, and you know, you had the the Nightmare on Elm Street and the Friday Thirteenth reboots that came out in the year like two thousand ten and nine, and those made money. But they didn't make enough compared to their budget to make it something they had to jump on, and the fans mm-hmm. hated them so much. That, you know, I think that made him take a little bit of a step back and say, well, if these movies are barely making money at the end of the day after production costs, marketing and all this stuff and people hate them and hate us for making them. <laughs> what do we do? Yeah, I it, feel like Friday 13th, though, that remake was not as hated as a lot of them as a lot of remakes. I just look at those movies, though, and it's like in order to make a reboot to make money, you have you can't make money off of your standing like fans. You have to draw on new mm-hmm, fans. Yeah. And none of those movies are drawing have, in. have drew in any yeah. new fans because well, people look at it and they're kind of you know when you have a movie that's 30 years old ridiculous yeah for you the have, most part. yeah they're ridiculous and you've had a movie that's been done like friday 13th not friday well even yeah and Nightmare on Street both have what almost 10 sequels apiece or, or there's more. there's a ton of movies in those series yeah, but i'm and... saying like when you get to somebody that like your major movie audience that probably makes a lot of money is you know younger people and it's like well, well yeah the horror that. the horror the horror audience is driven by the younger end of the spectrum in terms of making you know, a bunch of money yeah and i did an art i wrote an article about why 2016 won't be returned this last year after like you know all the stuff with halloween getting pushed back and you know it's the the i think the bottom line is the money um rob zombies halloween like the sequel made like 39 million dollars in the u.s on a budget of like 15 million and, you know, like I said, after you take all the cost into effect, that's not much profit. Once you've, you know, paid for all the marketing and everything, that's not a lot of money. But you go and you make, you know, even a movie like, uh, you know, some of the later Paranormal Activity sequels that were kind of not very well reviewed and not big hits. It's a lot It's a lot more palatable to make $39 million off of a $2 million budget yeah. or a $1 million budget and a relatively low amount of marketing than it is to continue these franchises where you have to, you know, there's a lot of pockets being lined by these franchises that existed for so long. And I think with Halloween, like a $15 million or lower budget is good because that doesn't let it balloon up and have a bunch of unnecessary cameos and <laughs> trying to get big star power to sell it. Like that forces them to try to make a, like the original Halloween was made on a very low budget. And I think that's the way to do it enough budget to make it look good and be convincing without giving them so much that they get lost in, you know, trying to figure out what to do. Well, I think it also, too, it's very smart for Blumhouse to get on this. Like, one, I'm sure they're probably fans of it. So, you know, it'd be like us if we were in that power. Like, oh, of course, let's try to do this, you know. But two, just like bringing in a different type of film and diversifying their portfolio. Because yeah. people, one, they're going to get franchise fatigue. Even though, you know, the Paranormal Activities, of course, now it's what, like Insidious and Sinister and yeah. all those films. Conjuring. Conjuring. Yeah. Even though those films are... Uh, you know, successful, they're starting to, you know, they're starting to pull the sequels into those, like, people will get tired of them just like anything else, so it's smart to kind of bring up a different type of genre of film, I think, yeah. and I think if they keep diversifying and, and 
you know, spend a little money, take, take a few risks here and there, and then make your money on the conjurings yeah. and stuff because you, people are going to get burned out on those pretty yeah, quick anyway. Yeah, it's so it's like, that, yeah, it's the best. Ed Amin will stretch their money on those films as well, yeah. I think. Because, like, that type of movies, I'm, I'm trying to think when the original uh, Paranormal Activity came out, but that'd be what? 2009. 2009. So you're talking, you know, eight, almost eight, nine years. It's getting close to, you know, being where it's kind of overdone. I think that's done you know? now, right? That yeah. Last, that I, last one. Yeah, but just that genre still, yes, though, yeah. is still strong, you know, yeah. uh, just the paranormal, you know, ghost type stuff, so. Yeah, I mean, I'll be interested to see, one, <clears throat> how this turns out, and two, where do they go from here? You know, it's, depending on how this does at the box office, yeah. could really set the future for, you know, horror, with yeah. Blumhouse being the top of it. If this takes off, you know, they may go heavy after any other old yeah. franchises, Um who knows what they'll do if they'll make another sequel to this one? Um, yeah, but like you said, though, if it kind of comes out and it just then and it's I a think, good movie, yeah, you know, then everybody else thing will be afraid to put well, any it, money if behind it has, any of the revivals or anything. Yeah. If it has the similar, if it has a similar fate to Scream Four, where it comes out and it gets decent reviews, and you know, it only like I said, if the let's say the budget for this is fifteen million. Let's say they hit that fifteen million mark and it makes forty. That's not really a success for me by a standpoint. Yeah. It needs to make at least. Like sixty or up, if it's you know at that budget level to be considered but, a big you know, success. That's just one thing to take in consideration too. When these movies comes out, like you gotta think if you're releasing Halloween up against like next year. I don't know if it's coming out next year when it would, but 2017. It's gonna be 2017, and they haven't really announced a release date, yeah. but hopefully they're smart enough to release it in mid September yeah, to well, October. What I'm saying yeah, is like you release it because you still have a bunch of Marvel movies coming out next year, and you have the new Star Wars coming out next year. So like if you release it around any of those movies. Yeah, you're, gonna, you're, you're yeah. not going to get anything. Like, who's going to want to watch a Halloween or re- part like, twenty? Releasing over, it like in April or some crap like that. That is a very terrible idea. Yeah. And I think even midsummer is too early. It needs to be mid September to mid October. Give it the but, full month of October yeah. to run out. But don't release well, it around yeah. any other huge name franchises that are billion dollars. Well, you they know, don't, don't release don't... big billion dollar franchises in October usually. No, Those but are I'm saying it's now like, in December that would be or the time you wouldn't want to because you're not going to. You can't release Halloween against any of the Marvel movies. Like, it's well, like, I, don't, it's I mean, I think it's kind of programming. It's definitely it's, come out in October. Yeah, it's sure. an R-rated well, we franchise. That, how many times have you seen Halloween movies what? set in how or set in October well, Halloween come out? Just based on the yeah. timeline of getting yeah. the movie made, yeah. I don't think they can do it much earlier yeah. than that. You think like, about, you know, there's not rushed, a script, there's not yeah, a I was saying, but We've seen them release movies set in October and uh, Halloween in December. Oh, I mean, like, know, so. yeah, I mean, they released um, Scream 4 in summer. Yeah. Or, no, it was actually in the spring. I think it was like April or something. Because we've always kind of talked about this a lot, that a lot of times your movies are perfect for halloween never get released in the month of october well, they always but halloween always... has a halloween movie ever came out in any time between the you know aside from the fall yeah. that's what i'm saying this yeah. is a halloween yeah, movie Hall- yeah i think You're, one based on the timeline yeah. and two it being halloween but then again they're not going to do that kind of talk about, this is an issue that i think krampus had that they released it in the beginning of december so its life was over when Christmas was over. Yeah, you well, know? I think so that horror that, films only last about a month at the box office yeah, anyway. So releasing have, it mid September, like yeah, September that would make more sense twenty something. You don't want to release it like Krampus, which I loved. I just think it shortens its shelf life or self uh, shelf life when you put it out in the same month that the movie is supposed to happen. Yeah. Because well, at the after same time, Christmas, if they release it, it's kind of like man. Eh, if you, you release know. it too early, though, then you don't like you don't have that connection. Oh yeah, I'm not saying they, to release... they released Halloween two in August. Yeah, that didn't. That wasn't the reason that film. <laughs> no, but I'm saying like but to me, like September. It was would unicorns. Make more, you might even release <laughs> or in September or something, but don't yeah. release it like October fifteenth, and then you have like. You know, two three weeks for the movie. You, you well, a I think I, said, I think that the best the best thing they can do, like, because I think the the Conjuring came out like in August, and you know, cleaned up because if like you do it after all the big franchise films are done, sometime from the very end of August to October is the sweet spot to release it. Because if you release it mid like mid to late September, they have the entire month of October, and you know, what's a better Halloween weekend date night movie than a Halloween, especially if it gets yeah. decent reviews and you know has decent cast and everything attached. But, but. I feel too like you're comparing it to The Conjuring is a little unfair because like The Conjuring is like a movie that well that just kind of came out of no, nowhere and was a smash hit. But it also it had, it was kind of based on like true events and I mean how many times have you got on one of like the Discovery channels or something and saw the story about it you know or like any of the like P- even have stuff on PBS about it you know so it's like. Something that I've always heard about my entire life. So it was interesting to see the movie. But um, what about James Wan? What is he doing yeah. next year? <laughs> um, I know he produced. Uh, 
Well, he's got the Conjuring 2 coming yeah. out, and he produced Lights Out. I'm not sure what he's got coming out next year. Well, there, to see that. there you go. Just give him Halloween. You <laughs> know what I mean? I would be happy with that. He's got the hot he, hand. And two, yeah, like he is somebody who... You know what I mean? He's kind of built some of these movies. Yeah. Like the, well, he directed uh, he a billion dollar un- franchise yeah. in Fast Seven. But, but he yeah, seems like, to understand how to get people to the theater. He and knows get story. Money. He knows yeah. storytelling too. Yeah. Like, he, well, I think if you, you know, have him direct, a lot of people are going to be up in arms. Like, no, not the Conjuring guy. But I just yeah. feel like you know sometimes you go with the hot hand. And but he also has never done. He has never done a slasher film. He may have no interest in doing well, it. Well, that's what I'm not. saying. I, I would yeah. be interested to see what he would do with it. It would be a more interesting choice than say somebody who has already made that type of film before. But they'll have Patrick Wilson in it for sure if he uh, yeah. if he directs. He'll but, be a sheriff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to see him. Me it, too. You know? But then again, like he's a familiar character or familiar face for yeah. a lot of these people because he's been in those movies yeah. for a while now. Put him in there. So but, uh, what do you all want out of this movie? Like when you go to the theater, how, how do you hope this goes? Because, you know, you're talking about how you can't make a traditional slasher film. Like what, what are kind of the beats you want this to hit? Like, like what would make you satisfied? I just... My, my biggest thing in a lot of these movies is, like, I just want them to go into it. Like, we already know what is existing in the universe. Don't give me any type of backstory. Because I hate watching these movies that they always t- retell. St- don't retell me anything. Don't act like I'm stupid. Just go in, kill a bunch of teenagers. I want a bunch of blood and gut- guts. That's it. I don't well, want, like, an in-depth story. Because I think when you give Michael Myers and Slashers too much of a story... I don't want that. I well, just like, want him killing people. What I had said before was, you know, like in the article I wrote, because when I thought about this, I think it's like 2015, like February something, of early 2015. Just kind of focus on what made Halloween kind of scary. It's kind of like, you know, like Michael Myers, just like in the movies, he was the shape. In the original movies, he was listed as a shape. So just this, you know, blank person that, you know, you have no idea what their motivations or reasons are. I mean, the, the problem is you've already been told what they are. And even if yeah. you retcon out the later films, you still have people having that idea in their head. So the first thing is make Michael Myers scary again. And, you know, don't give family, you know, this convoluted backstory on yeah, Strodes backstory. and Myers and Loomis's and all this. Just have him in Don't a be. suburban area killing people. That's it. And, you know, take the, the lessons of the first film, like, you know, less is more. Have him on the periphery of scenes in the shadows and not, you know, in your face and and all that. And, and two, for God's sake, make a good mask. Don't use yeah. some of these terrible looking masks they've yeah. used. And two, you know, you don't have to address the fact that Michael Myers is now 60 years old. Just assume he does CrossFit and he's on HGH. Yeah. Just, like Sylvester Stallone yeah, or I just something. Th- I think a lot of times, like, when people get in there, each director. No, this isn't always true, but a lot of people want to re- have their own spin on it. It's like, don't give me that. Just get in there. Just pick whatever continuity you want. Like well, you said, because there's going to be a bunch of... I don't even think you have to go into it. You just have him show yeah. up and start killing well, he people. Had to, but, people have to probably... Because he's going to... Whatever universe he exists in, people are going to know of him based on his past exploits. But, like, just have him killing people. I, so here's what I, I... I don't want, like, annoying teenage kids. No. Like, yeah. I, want, I want to somehow... I want them to be able to make a cast of characters that you actually like. Where, it's, where if they were in another film, you would enjoy watching them. Almost like... Yeah. You know, I just watched uh, Everybody Wants Some, you know, like that or Daisy Confused. Like, I want there to be characters that you would like to just see. Yeah. Um, obviously, don't stay out. Don't lean on them too hard because, y- you know, you're not there to see them hang yeah. out. But give you just <laughs> enough, you know, and you can pull a lot from a well-written character and just short little scenes. And you can learn a lot about them and, and like them very quickly if done correctly. You know, if crack that nut one. I, yeah, I definitely don't want any family links to the Strodes, but at the same time, I almost feel like there needs to be somebody like a Loomis type character. He doesn't have to explain things um, to anybody. You know, he doesn't have to be there just to explain things away. But at the same time, there has to be somebody there who um, kind of has this um, reason for finding Michael. I feel like there needs to be something else going on besides him walking around because yeah. then it turns into just a Friday the 13th movie where, yeah. you know, it's just going killing person to person or or maybe one of the kids you know uh is trying to get revenge on herself or something you know what i mean maybe yeah. their, their, their dad's a sheriff but well i think that was kind of the halloween return story was that it was the child who is 18 of one of michael's victims from the first movie and there's like a cop who was from the first movie so like those things have been tossed around like those types of connections yeah. it's just i think that if you like i don't want too many i just want at least one person that you know has a reason for going after him. Because it seems like after the... trying to help people. Because you had the first movie that took place in the suburbs. The second one took place mostly in a hospital. 
The fourth one took place mostly in that really large house. The fifth one took place mostly in a field. The sixth one took place mostly in a hospital. And I think that having these huge set pieces kind of is for budgetary reasons and timing, and they just didn't write great scripts or have much time. So I think setting it back in the suburbs opens it up and makes it feel like Mm -hmm. a more expansive movie than if it all takes place in this unrealistically large house or at this barn party out in the middle of nowhere. Like, I think that if you make it back in the, the suburbs and open it up and it's, you know, Michael could be anywhere, like, in these suburbs and you're trying to get away and you could even approach, like, like I said, like, what the differences are in living in the suburbs now versus, you know, 1970-something that, you know, everybody has a cell phone that connects them to the entire world, but in the moment, do you know anyone that lives close to you that could actually help you if you needed it? Yeah. Like, you could approach that yeah. type of idea. Or you could just set it not in this current day. Because I don't know if a slasher... The way, like what you said, with cell phones and technology and stuff, it could really be as effective. But the thing is, you have, so you have this cell phone, right? And you call the police or whatever. But if you're like running around in a neighborhood area being chased and somebody's trying to kill you and you have a cell phone, the fact that you can call people or tweet or fi- put a Facebook message or well, take a picture to kill you does no, does, uh, no, that. well, that's not the point. The point I'm making <laughs> is the fact you have this phone that can connect you to anyone in the entire world, but you probably don't know anybody in your immediate vicinity who could help you in a moment of need. Like, that's something you could explore. Well, but. for me, I think, you know, good gore and all that's all fine and well, but make the scenes tense. Yeah. But also, too, if they can find a way to kind of exploit what you're talking about, William, in a natural way, yeah. then I think that's good. But I don't want it to feel like it being a conscious examination of that, because then yeah. that kind well, of pulls just, you out of it, thinking about, like, yeah, I don't want oh, this is how, announced. I just want, like, a good story. Yeah. Well, that's and, just the context and, for how this stuff would unfold. Yeah. Like, I don't want I, a crappy MTV public service announcement movie. I want a good <laughs> slasher. Well, I'm not saying you make it a message movie, because that's not what those movies are. In Halloween, I think a lot of the meaning people assigned oh, to it was after the yeah, fact. Yeah, it was after the fact. But I think you just use that as, like, you know, okay, like, like you could have a very tense scene if somebody's in their house and you know <laughs> my wi is out and I'm getting killed. Oh no. Well the other thing that I like to see you approach because like in all these movies, everyone has unrealistically large houses with like multiple rooms. Like set it in a small house. If you're in a house that's like two like stories with three rooms. Foot. Like and somebody <laughs> breaks in that you can hear them downstairs, like it's Michael Myers, like what do you do to escape this house? Like they never really from or what I can gather. Won't they ever have somebody that's like Another thing too, this is just my take on slashers. You always majority of the time they're very helpless people, so that you know maybe not have everybody so helpless. Well, that's why you know, like I think Adam Wing- Wingard's a good choice because like your next kind of has this reversal of oh yeah. you think you know it's a home invasion thing you think they're all helpless and then somebody's not yeah, and then the fun. guest is kind of a matchup of a bunch of different matchup things. was a I mean the guest was a. It was, uh, I, I really enjoyed that one too. It was a little bit different twist on that. But Whereas was, Hush, I felt like, um, you know, I said like, we when we reviewed it, we said like, somebody puts a cell phone in their back pocket and it's lingered on like very specifically. And yeah. then it's a very big plot point later that goes nowhere. Yeah. And it's just like, I don't want anything. That maybe it could have been like 30 minutes instead of an hour and a half. Yeah, that could have been a section of an bad, anthology yeah. if they had pared yeah. it down. Yeah. Well, another thing too, like I wasn't on the podcast for Hush because my internet was having issues. But my question is the movie is like, why? You know, like, you well, didn't I mean, I think do it's anything, just, you didn't introduce anything different, you didn't give me anything different, you gave me... Well, I think there was an attempt, too, but it just wasn't, it didn't kind of, it, they didn't hit a home run with that. Yeah, it's kind of like, instead of having a normal girl, we're going to have a death girl. Well, too, so I guess uh, we can like, go ahead and kind of wrap okay, up this well, discussion. Real quick, though, what did Carpenter, his recent comments about, oh. um, you know, why Halloween works and kind of slasher films that came after that? Well, I think that, like, some of the stuff he said wasn't necessarily, like, why Halloween worked. It was just that, you know, Halloween was kind of this, you know, pared down, kind of, you know straightforward movie and its financial success inspired a lot of the other movies to exist simply from a cynical money standpoint and you, you know he said like that that was friday the 13th but you know like to be fair um sean s cunningham who's behind friday the 13th didn't even literally say that he saw how we make a lot of money took out an ad for friday the 13th where they'd even made it yeah and then was wanting to push it just because he knew he'd make a lot of money with yeah it. sean s cunningham he's been open he was there to make some money it was you know you know um you know, just the fact who they, the people they brought together, you know, like, you know, directing it and writing it and starring in it and special effects and all that, all that was coincidental to his success, <laughs> but it was an idea that was, you know, spun off wanting to make money before it was, I have this vision of horror. Mm-hmm. So I yeah. think that, you know, you know, like, you know, you say like that movie turns out to be a classic and it spawns, you know, how many sequels and makes how much money. Yeah. But, you know, I think John Carpenter's comments, just a lot of those movies were just, you know, let's make money. And I think a lot of people forget that now and they watch all these slashers or like all the glood of horror that came out in like the early 80s. 
a lot of those, yes, there were people that were very passionate, but a lot of that wasn't like, I've had this lifelong vision for what I want horror to be. It's more of, that movie made a ton of money, so let's get someone to make something similar. Okay, this guy has an idea. Let's give this guy money. Let's throw as much gore into it as possible. Okay, well, let's get it cut by the MPAA and have all these X-rated cuts that exist or whatever. Because, you know, like everybody always talks about the cuts that got made and everything had to get stuff cut from it back in that era. And even today, people still have to get stuff cut by the MPAA. But, you know, I think that the idea that all those movies are chasing money, it's not, you know, incorrect. And a lot of those movies, people I think when we discussed, um, what was the movie we did? Uh, Last or Maniac Cop. Mm-hmm. That's one where I think a lot of people, just because they saw it a certain era, they may have an, af- an affinity for it that isn't necessarily warranted by the quality of the movie. And I think this is all of those slashers from the 80s go that aren't the mainstream ones. People saw them at a certain time and loved them. And it, you know, it's easy to let that nostalgia and all that overlook the fact a lot of these movies were you know, just plays to make money. But that's most movies, really. They try to make money. You, you sometimes get someone that has a great vision for it. But from the studio's perspective, pumping out a bunch of slashers and sequels was simply to make money. It wasn't like there was an artistic statement being made there. And I, you know, I'd agree with Carpenter on that. I think that there were some good movies that came out of that and some very creative people that got to make movies. Because, you know, like when Sam Raimi and Rob Taper were working on trying to make a movie, they didn't say, yeah, you know, like, oh, we want to make a horror. Like we love, you know, they, obviously they love horror now, but they weren't like spurning to change the landscape of horror I think it was Rob Tabert said, like, well, horror movies are cheap to make and make a lot of money. Let's make one of those. And then they set down a path that made what they made. Well, so you can every, have good things come out of it. Yeah. But the thing is, a lot of them, the inspiration was money more than anything else. Well, isn't it the entire point of making a movie? You don't, you're not going to go spend money and time and effort to make something to not make money off of it. Well, so you, have, you, you, have the pure, you have the pure auteur and artist who's only interested in bringing their vision to the screen, yeah. who doesn't care about the money side they of it. They say that, but I feel like at the end of the day, if you put a lot of work into something, you, you like to make some money off of it. Well, I mean, there's people yeah, who are well, more motivated. enough to keep working yeah. at the very least, but then there's people up that are trying to, you know. Because there's people more vi- motiv- uh, motivated by their story and what they want to do than they are by the fact financial uh yeah. prospects of it but so i guess we can like i said until we get, we'll get more information on this as things happen we'll discuss it as we find out more and who gets attached to it and you know once they start to leak any details on what the story could be because there's no script currently that i'm aware of so and let us know like if you're watching this on youtube or if you want to go to our youtube page our facebook page give us a comment about what you hope this movie is what you don't want it to be um and who you'd like to see directed yep so uh so like I said, I think that was all the major news that we had to, we had to discuss. So we can move into the um, things we've been watching. Oh, and there's one correction I'll make for last week. I uh, referenced uh, Lethal Weapon, and I mixed them up. I said that uh, Murtaugh was the uh, the cop that was like breaking all the rules and stuff, and it's Riggs mm-hmm. because Mar- uh, Mel Gibson was Riggs, and I don't I confuse those characters. It's been a while since I've seen those movies. I actually just bought a Blu-ray <laughs> collection of that. We got it in yesterday. So I put in my notes. I was like. Uh, correct lethal weapon confusion. Mel Gibson was rigged. So that's what I wrote the other night before I went to bed and I remembered <laughs> it. But so yeah, that's the uh, correction. And then for what we've been watching, um, so we want all of us saw X Men Apocalypse and we're going to discuss that a little bit and then we'll save like the majority of the discussion for the very end of the podcast so we don't. Because there's a hi- lot to say about that. Film. We don't want to hijack this horror podcast. And, a bunch and of- just like about films in general as well as like the structure. But, um, you know, it came out this weekend, it, you know, doesn't like its opening was nowhere close to that of Civil War or you know, anything it's going to end up making. How did it compare to Deadpool? Uh, less. Better. Yeah. So it's going to end up making for like the three day weekend, I think about like sixty five million dollars. And then for the four day Memorial Day weekend, probably somewhere around like 80, which is, you know, still a solid opening and can have it make, you know, three hundred million dollars domestically by the end of its run. But you compare that to, you know, these Marvel movies now where, you know. $200 million is a new benchmark of, you know, that's what you want to hit. Yeah. So the, the the opening of it wasn't great. Uh, the critical consensus on it, you know, I think on Rotten Tomatoes, it's been hovering around like, you know, 48, 40 to, you know, somewhere between like 40 to 50 percent. And that compared to Days of Future Past, which is the last movie that had, you know, pretty much universally positive but on reviews. on Rotten Tomatoes, it's still only like a 75 percent. So it's not like it was a 90 or something. It was... That movie was one of them that all in this because I love these this group of action movies, but like even with uh, First Class, it wasn't highly rated on Rotten Tomatoes either. But they're you but they're more generally well they liked, were generally and the reviews movies, yeah. themselves were all pretty positive. If you go to IMDb, they have better scores. Man. But you know, X Men Apocalypse was one where they, by the name alone, they promised an apocalypse, which was you know a lot of destruction. 
And I guess we can just kind of briefly give, you know, the thoughts and then kind of just move on before we get into discussing the blob. But, um, you know, I thought that the movie had terrible special effects. Like some of them looked okay, but some of it looked cheap. Some of it looked like really low res textures and looked really fake. Did you see it in 2D? Yes. I saw it in 3D. So none of that stood out to me. And it's just like, I think what happens is the budget on this was actually lower than Days of Future Past. So I think they realize with these X-Men movies that they're not going to make as much as the Avengers because, you know, they don't have that that hype machine and all the movies built into it, and they don't have the huge movie stars. Granted, Robert Downey Jr. became a movie star again because of Iron Man, but his name alone now sells a movie. So these X-Men movies, they don't get as much budget as some of those. They don't get as much budget as Batman v Superman just because, you know, they don't have the prospects to make as much, theoretically. So a lot of the special effects, like some of the stuff just looked fake. Yeah. Like there's like shipping containers and it looked like they're being flying around. I was like, this looks terrible. But I'll say this too. And I even talked about this on one of the podcasts a while back. Like I'm a huge fan of Days of Future Past. And even that movie, like the Sentinels and other parts of it. I remember I went back and watched a couple weeks ago just to kind of refresh myself on this movie. And it's like, man, it was kind of bad, you know, like and so, that's the Blu-ray format. Well, it's just well, one thing. So for me, I didn't love this movie. Like I thought it was actually when I was watching it, I felt like, oh, this is about as good as X Men Three to me. So See, I didn't, and, yeah, and, I had the, and the, the thing about end. the thing about the budget, like the budget doesn't matter for some of the effects and fight scenes, but one thing the budget doesn't matter for is good characters. And I don't think any of the characters made me like them. It was just like, oh, these are some X Men. I know who they are, but none of them were well written enough to make me care about them or actually want to like be with them through those early moments of the film. Oh. Quicksilver was the only one that had any sort of like real good character about him. And other than that, it was just kind of like waiting for this movie to end. Well, it's like with me, like, um, so you have like your main leads back in James McAvoy, uh, Jennifer Lawrence and Michael Fassbender. And I thought they all did good jobs. I don't think they really gave, um, Jennifer Lawrence, and Michael Fassbender enough to do. Cause they just kind of sat around and like, uh, with Jennifer Lawrence, like she just kind of didn't really have that many lines, really. I mean, she's in a lot of scenes, but didn't really say much. A lot of people didn't have much to do until and, nearly the end. And I feel like that's because the movie is like a big uh, ensemble with a bunch of people. And like, you know, Quicksilver is the best character in this movie and the last one. Like that character is awesome. Yeah, and compared the to the best it, use of special yeah. effects they've had. And you like watch that version of Quicksilver and you see the completely terrible horrendous version they had in age of Ultron. It's like what like they did that you know it just i know maybe it's not a fair comparison but and the actor that I picked i feel like was a better choice well like when you saw the pictures of him like when they were revealing the stuff for days of future past it looks stupid it looks stupid it in the movie and you're like i don't know it's one of my fa- i think that's one of the shiny moments out of this movie but i mean to be fair i get you, you all aren't as big as fans of it. i loved it, it like, i mean like when i, I was really growing up enjoyed- and- when I was growing up as a kid in the 90s, I loved the X-Men animated series. I read a lot of those comics, you know, had the toys and stuff. And, like, the movies, like, the first X-Men, like, it's kind of funny to rewatch it now because it's pretty quaint. And the fact that, like, the major battle mostly takes place in the gift shop of the uh, Li- or the um, Statue of Liberty. <laughs> and then X2, I thought, I still think X2 is the best movie they made in the series. But have you watched it lately? I've watched like, it in the past couple years. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't watch... In lieu of this movie coming out, I went and watched all original three X Men. And I watched, I've watched every single X Men movie to date. While, like, the original one, with the exception of Last Stand, are still good, they're so 2000s and, like, late 90s, it's almost hard to watch. Well, I think part of the, the and, thing, too, is that the X Men were at their best an allegory for civil rights or for gay rights or mm-hmm. for stuff that has to do with social commentary. Yeah. And this movie abandoned that almost completely, and it wasn't really subtext. It was just like, oh, people were afraid of Magneto, my, and that's kind of it. Yeah, my favorite thing about the X-Men that makes them unique is that my favorite stories are the ones where people are out to get the X-Men, you know, because it makes it personal, mm-hmm. and you can kind of care about the characters more, and normally they're more character development. This movie was a lot of time setting up the plot about what was going to happen and just getting from point A to B to C. And no real consequences because you know who is in the first X Men movie. I mean, spoiler alert: you know the yeah. world doesn't end. Yeah, um, but I, I gotta say this too, though. Like people have a lot of continuity issues with this, and this is what me and William have argued about a lot. But they kind of retconned a lot of that with Days of Future Past because you change so much of what's 
happened, so you could. But it doesn't get away change. With, it doesn't change people's get, ages. You can't get away with the ages stuff. But then again, you know, this isn't the only movie. So that's you're ever telling me that. you're telling me that between 1983 and like 19, well, I guess technically the first movie came out in 2000. So you're telling me from 83 to 2000, you go from James McAvoy to Patrick Stewart. Yeah. And you go from Michael Fassbender to Ian McKellen. Well, at least <laughs> I'll give him some type of years. credit to try to keep. Because, like, you have those actors, and they're very good, so you want to keep them in the movie, but like you said... You At go, a certain point, you just have to embrace the fact that it's a superhero movie yeah, where yeah. people can See, fly. I don't, I don't buy in, I don't read into that much. It's just kind of whatever to me, uh, but... I, know, I really enjoyed it. I think this kind of got the Batman versus Superman treatment because it wasn't a happy go lucky. Everybody holds hands and sings Kumbaya like they do I would in the say that, films so, that people... I was actually just kind of bored in this film, but yeah. I wasn't bored in the other one. But I'll say, like, I think after your comment, we should save the rest for the yeah, end. Yeah, we'll, we'll move on. I just think, you know, ultimately, it's a good, it's a decent enough popcorn movie. If you've enjoyed all the X Men films going up to this, I say there's no reason not to see this one. It's just, it's not like First Class was good, Days of Future Past was good, and expanded the scope a little bit, made a little bit bigger movie. This one, like, goes to a bigger, more destructive place, which the X Men movies hadn't really done before. But it does so in a way that there's not much um, levity to it. There's not much, you know, stuff there. Aside from seeing like, oh, this is a character I wanted to see on screen. Here's Jean Grey. This is awesome. Like beyond that, that nobody gets enough time to really shine. And but then again, that's also kind of how the X-Men comics were and all the other stuff because there's so many characters. I thought it was a good enough movie. Like if you want to see it and you liked all the X-Men films, you can go ahead and see it. You'll probably still get enjoyment out of it. But it's not going to blow anybody away or, um, you know, I'd be interested to see how it performs, you know, at the end of the day at the box office if that changes any of their plans. But Daredevil is going to end up making quite a bit more money than this movie. Daredevil? Which, or not Daredevil, Deadpool. These All these comic books. Deadpool <laughs> will have been the most likely the most successful X-Men film worldwide. <laughs> the despite, Ben Affleck movie, Daredevil, yeah. from the 2000s William is going to happen. Was that Daredevil yeah. movie? <laughs> Yeah, Deadpool, not Daredevil. He's we'll, graping it up with Ben Affleck. Deadpool will be the most successful X Men film, despite having the lowest budget and you know lack of star power compared to the other films. But I thought it was enjoyable enough. I actually enjoyed Deadpool more. Mm. But I think this is one like I'll rewatch I Deadpool, it. But I just think they had a lot of characters that were underutilized. You know, um, Olivia Munn as uh, Psylocke had like three lines of dialogue. And they gave her the com the the costume that came the closest to its comic um, origins, and it was also the one that could be considered like the most like sexually charged. So it's but, kind of an odd choice. To- well, I'll say this too though, in just that defense. Now the the girl that played Storm or the woman that played Storm, she's twenty five, but like Jean Grey, that girl was well. They're not going to give her the Olivia Munn's like mid thirty, so I can understand maybe doing that because. But like it's, this goes back to the Avengers have shown that you can do true to comic, you know suits and get away with it so well i i think true. one more thing i think that for me it's time to reboot this entire franchise because these films have changed so much from the 2000 when they started they made fun of like those those costumes yeah superhero movies have reached a point a mass acceptance where they have massively changed and i think they could use a refresher because superhero films are not what the, what what, the, what they once were and this is like the longest running franchise and it's just become very convoluted what? and you know, it's well, they've, they've told their story. I feel like holding more on than to enough. the original cast when they like first class rebooting it, but then bringing the original cast back. Yeah, has mixed it together so it all still feels like the same continuity. And I don't know how long you can keep that yeah, going. I think, I think if they do that nineties one and that Wolverine cut the ties and then refresh. Well, I kind of the only thing that is, I really like the actor they got for Cyclops and Gene and the actors they got for Gene Gray. So I like to continue to see them and the, I like the cast of the Young Mutants they have in this one. So I would like to see them return in the new films. Well, I think I, they I could like use Deadpool. They could use Deadpool as a launching point to do some like X Four stories and stuff that's not the X Men and get away from all of the characters you've seen yeah, before. Wolverine's gonna be sitting for a while, so but, uh, I think that the third Wolverine would probably be like Sean's. I think that will be the end of you know but, Patrick uh, Seward in there. All right, and, so we can we right, can so move Slasher. On. You watch Slasher. Yeah, I was gonna cover that real quick because I'm gonna do a video blog about that this week, or I'll go more in depth on it, but. It is on Netflix Watch Instant. It originally aired in the U.S. on Chiller, and it was a co-production with the Canadian channel. It's only eight episodes as opposed to 12 or 15 or 10. Are uh, they half hour or hour? Hour. So compare it to, like, MTV Scream, which was 10, 10, it was 10 episodes that were an hour, you know, cut down for time. It was more like 40-something minutes. But uh, and the Scream Queens was technically 15 episodes, although two of them were 
uh, two hour long. So it was, there was only 13 airings of the show, I believe. But the um, this is eight one hour episodes, which I think is to its benefit because they're not padding the story out with a bunch of uh, nothing happening. Um, it's kind of funny that this Scream Queens and MTV Scream all have a similar premise in that 20 or 30 years ago, somebody died, somebody got killed like mysteriously. You go to the present day and that person's kid has to deal with the fallout of it and find out what happened in the past because somebody's killing people in the future or in the current day. The one thing I'll give this show over those other ones is that it is adults and not teenagers or college students, which is refreshing for once because everybody's, you know, like 20, 30 something. So it's not people in high school. Um, The gore in it is pretty good. There's some CGI gore that's pretty noticeable, but... And that's, who directed all these episodes? Uh, I don't know. I didn't. Quit hitting the mic. <laughs> I didn't watch. I didn't. I didn't look it all up because the direct. Well, the, the, he maybe he just directed the pilot. Um, whoever directed at least the pilot was the reason why I was interested in this. Yeah, I didn't even look up the. Yes, Craig Craig David Wallace, who did Todd in the uh, in the book of Pure Evil, which was a, a Canadian TV show that was actually pretty good from what I've seen. Um, it's kind of like a metal demonic show yeah it's, yeah it's pretty funny too um so yeah it makes sense that he was doing this, f- but, this show but um like i said there was you know there's there's at least a kill per episode um like i said the gore was pretty good there's some of that was pretty obviously cgi that was just due to budget reasons and timing i would assume um but it was a much more straightforward show like the you know there was almost no humor and it. it wasn't a comedy or anything of that nature but i would i enjoyed it more than mtv scream Simply because it was more, um, like from getting to end, like a more comprehensive package. It felt like they had a mystery. They didn't spend three episodes accomplishing nothing. They had action in every episode. Um, the kind of downfall of the show is I didn't really connect with any of the characters. So I didn't really care as much about the mystery. Uh, but I thought it was shot well, it looked good. I really liked the lighting they used in it. I thought it was all, you know, looked really good. Um, aside from some of the kind of CG stuff, but, um, so it, is this going to be like a one-off series or so you know if there's going to be a they said second series, there's going to be a second season between anthology type series, like American horror story, where each season is a different story, which I think is good. Cause Great. I don't think there's enough there to carry it from season to season with the characters they've etched out. Um, and like, it's like the main character, like Sarah, you know, she's, you know, an interesting character and, you know, but I don't. I didn't really connect with all the characters to really care when people are going to die. It's like, oh, well, this guy was in here since this episode. So, oh, they're killing him. Yeah. But I thought it was better than MTV Scream just as a better comprehensive product. Um, granted, it was, you know, aimed at a more adult audience than something that's airing on MTV. But, you know, didn't reinvent anything. It was just kind of a solid slasher story. Like, you know, we're saying like a, if this was condensed down to a two hour mo- or one and a half to two hour movie. I don't think that it's going to set anything on fire because it's just, you know, a competently told slasher story that didn't overstay its welcome. But even like the last episode, I was like, well, they're kind of stretching here for this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like when the reveal finally happened, you're like, well, there's only so many people it could be since they killed so many people. Yeah. And, you know, it really wasn't like a surprising reveal or anything. I wouldn't put on the same level as something like I would have rated like Hannibal. I don't think this is good as something like Bates Motel or some of those other shows, but I did like it more than MTV Scream. Well, I think that you'd almost like anything more than that because I mean, it, it was MTV Scream. It wasn't like an atrocious show. It was just I think it did, it didn't do anything with its premise, and it was just kind of a paint by you know. Eventually, it didn't really do any, it didn't break any new ground. Yeah, it was just uninspired. Slasher doesn't break any new ground, but I think it's all competently done, and I got enjoyment out of watching the episodes. And I think for for horror people, there you know. There is some good gore in there. There's some good practical gore. And like I said, there's a little bit of CG they use because of timing and stuff like that. But there's enough there for horror fans. And it's only eight episodes, which, you know, is still a pretty decent investment of time. But if you're looking for a series to watch on Netflix and you're into horror, I, you know, it's something I would recommend checking out. And if you watch the first episode and you like it, I don't think it has a dip in quality in any of the episodes. I think it's all pretty good. So if you like that first episode, then I would recommend checking out the remainder because it's it's only eight, which is a I wish more shows would just trim it down yeah. to an amount of episodes that's manageable mm-hmm. versus padding it out like Screen Queens where it definitely did not have 15 hours of content. But uh, yeah, I enjoyed it, but um, it's nothing that's like, oh, you have to watch this. But I'll do a, a video blog and go to a little bit more depth on it and discuss a little bit more on it. So uh, 
So for me, I really didn't watch many other horror shows because my wife and I are still trying to make our way through Game of Thrones. <laughs> so that takes up a lot of time. So I'm, we're trying to catch up before the end of this current season that's, that's on right now. But we did see the nice guys also in uh, theaters. And that film, like compared to like the X-Men, it's something you can go in and just watch and just enjoy it because it's like great writing, great characters, great structure. Um, of course, Shane Black directed it, who did like Iron Man 3, wrote Lethal Weapon. He's in the new uh, Predator film. Um, so anyway, that's like just a great summer film to see. Um, and just like super fun, but buddy action film. Um, other than that, I didn't watch anything else. I don't think Derek, did you, I just the blob, uh, and I watched like the 1950s version. Too, yeah. 58. Yeah. Uh, the Steve which, McQueen. Yeah. Which I always, always remember that one. And then that just the X-Men. So, yeah. All right, so, uh, we can move into the discussion now of the 1988 version of the blob and, this is a movie that I hadn't really seen. I watched the original when I was younger, and I'd never really watched the remake. And it's kind of funny that we're reviewing this uh, a few weeks after we did the um, the stuff, which I think you know, same general time frame, kind of good movies that compare to each other a little bit. Um, completely different style of movies, but the basic premise is like an ooze that kills people. So you could say they're a little bit similar. In a conspiracy, yeah, in conspiracy. Because this was actually. Uh in my suggestion, because I remember watching this movie 25 now. I think the first time I saw it was like the only time I saw it when I was like 12. And I always remember it left like a huge impact on me because some of the gore scenes. Mm-hmm. But we were talking about this too. Like there's a big lull in between some of the opening action, which it still takes a while to get to it and yeah. stuff later on. But. Oh, so the basic premise is just from IMDb, a strange life form consumes everything in its path as it grows and grows. So pretty <laughs> and simple. And the blob, even if you haven't seen it, I feel like people know yeah. it's like such an iconic thing. Yeah. I mean, you can't assume, <laughs> but from when I was a kid, before I'd even seen any of the, the, the original or the remake, yeah. I knew what the blob, you know what yeah, I mean? Like, yeah, just, it's something that even if you haven't watched anything directly, there's so many cartoons that yes. you grow on that make a reference yeah. to the blob and just so many different things and uh but i just remember watching it and it was one of those movies when i was younger just left a big impact on me as far as like some of the gore scenes well and it felt like such an aggressive remake because yeah. the other one was from the 50s you know it was a lot like yeah. as william said earlier about the x-men is like more quaint compared yeah. to this and this is just like goes all out and yeah. it's some of the most brutal gore scenes in in an 80s film that, yeah. that you'll see. That's because, like, in the beginning of the film, like I said, it starts off kind of People slow. in pain. It's not just yeah. them dead. Yeah, yeah. It's not Yeah, it's not just they die immediately. They are being, like, eaten consumed up. Like, alive. Yeah, yeah, consumed alive. And, you know, a lot of the characters in the movie, honestly, are really forgettable. Eight, 1980s stereotypical teenage, you know, roles. You have, like, the rebel, and you have the jock douches, and you have, like, the... Which I think were kind of by design, because it yeah. was almost like a throwback to the 50s. Yeah, which but, it, it fit in. Yeah. yeah, like, in the context of the movie, it was, like, it's set in the 80s, but it very much felt like it could have been well, set too, in the 50s. So this, was, this movie is directed by Chuck Russell, and, um, you know, had multiple writers. One of the writers was Frank Darabont, who, if you're not aware... You know, directed Shawshank Redemption, Green Mile, The Mist, you know, uh, was the showrunner for The Walking Dead's first season and did the premiere episode. So, you know, Frank Darabont, this is relatively earlier in his career. And you can, you know, and some of the actors in this have appeared in other Frank Darabont stuff. But the cast for the main characters, you have Shawnee Smith, who is Meg. And, you know, if you don't remember, she was on Becker. And then for horror fans, more relevantly, she was in uh, the Saw films. Kevin Dillon, who, if you ever watch Entourage, was Johnny Drama, is kind of the uh, James Dean wannabe leather jacket smoking renegade. And, you know, you have a number of other characters. There's some reversals and people, you know, that this is one of those movies where it kind of reverses main characters at some point because there's a person you think is the main character. Then it's, you know, flip flops like, OK, that's not the main character. Kind of like, like, Ma- yeah. like Maniac Cop did, but this yeah. did it a lot earlier in the movie. And so a lot it made more, more sense. Yeah. Like it wasn't just it's like, OK, well, people are going to die in this film yeah. Like, horribly. Yeah. Like and Bill Mosley was soldier number two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's funny because there's some people in the movie you see and they're, they're, they're somewhat recognizable. Like, I had once William came back and told Jack me. Jack Nance is in it, yeah, a very like, small role. Yeah, and it's like, okay, I know, you know, they're, but in this movie, you know, it's just one of those things. Like, I, like one of the most brutal scenes is uh, after the. This home, is going to be full spoilers. Yeah, full yeah. spoilers. It just came out in 90, 1988. And yeah. it's so. free on Crackle to watch yeah. as well if you want. Uh, but in one of the scenes, one of the people you think is going to be lead is one of the jocks in the movie or football player. Gets consumed by the blob, and so you see he's melting his flesh off. And Meg tries to rescue him, and his arm sloughs off mm-hmm. and falls on the floor. And that was like the one scene that always stuck with me for however long I've seen it, you know, for the 10 plus years, because I love watching that scene because it's like 
You think he's a lead, and then he literally probably receives the most brutal on-screen death. Yeah. You know? And you can almost see his face, like, melting away yeah. as he's, like, pushing it through the blob. Yeah. Like, um, it's, And you can, like, see the pain in yeah. his face. His arm comes off. It's it's great. That and I think that's one reason that appealed me to, to cover this movie is, like, that scene alone. But you go back and you watch it, and I guess, too, for budgetary reasons, there's not a whole lot of those scenes. Because I would assume, like, that's probably a lot more expensive and time-consuming to do than, like, uh, just somebody getting stabbed. Yeah, the and, and two, though, they, they kind of mix them up as well. So yeah. I think it's good that, like, not everybody dies kind of in no, the same fashion. No, it, it would make it not the, as... Yeah, the, the, the woman who worked at the uh, restaurant, you know, the yeah. blob kind of, like, hits her like a wave inside yeah, of in the, the phone booth. Yeah, and then she sees the yeah. sheriff. Like, that was actually it. one of the coolest scenes, too, is that she's in the phone booth trying to call the sheriff's office. Like, oh, the sheriff's at the diner. And then you see like his decomposing face <laughs> yeah. like hit up against the phone booth and slide up. You know, like that was so, that was awesome. The movie had an estimated budget of $19 million and made like eight point something. So it was a flop commercially. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those, a lot of times you have movies that are flops initially that grow a cult following or, you know, the opinion kind of switches and people are really in favor of them and like, okay, we love this. This movie, you don't see much of a groundswell of support for. I just remember the video cover of it, seeing it at the video stores when I was younger. And, um, but you know, the movie, like the performances are all kind of by the numbers. Yeah. Nobody really, um, nobody stole the show when you know, like, you comparing know. it to the stuff, there's not as many memorable characters in this yeah. movie as there were in the stuff. Well, what was it? The, uh, uh, the clowns from the killer clowns from outer space. There's no scene where somebody gets melted and it just sticks with you. Like, the, <laughs> hey, what are you doing? Pat of the face. Like, there's there's no terror. Like, when you said it's pretty by the numbers. So there's like no scene so bad that's memorable. But it's almost are, too well made. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, the characters aren't strong enough. Yeah, the characters aren't strong enough. But I think the one thing that kind of bothers me a little bit about this movie is like, even though some of the gore scenes are really nice, like when you said it doesn't have like a huge following. You know, like. Well, and- you know, and two, like, so I, I, I didn't come up with this analogy myself, but I saw it in the movie and I had read other people say it was that, you know, the 50s movie, The Blob, was just from outer space, knows more of our commentary, like, on our fear of communism and, like, so, like Russia and socialism and, you know, the other from, like, Europe. So you have, like, those fears. Europeans. Or, you know, or no. just, like, <laughs> like, Russian communism. It's, like, you know, more of, like, a metaphor for that type of stuff. And this one was a much more cynical movie made in the 80s. Where it's more about like, you know, instead of the blob being like the threat of something like that, it's more like the threat of AIDS or, you know, a biological agent. And it's a little bit more cynical movie for the times. And I can kind of see that because there's like um, the conspiracy angle to it that, you know, it's actually a biological weapon that's being tested. Our own people. And you, know, so yeah. you have this more cynical worldview on it, which kind of makes sense in the 80s versus, you know, the 50s. And, you know, like you said, in this one, the, the hero character you know, ends up not being the squeaky clean jock, but kind of like the loner rebel and then a cheerleader. Like there's always like in those movies. And like, I like Shawnee Smith in this. No, yeah, she's, bit. yeah, she's pretty good in this. Yeah. And, you know, kind of like, you know, um, the good girl character, but it's not like the damsel in distress. She actually is the one that rescues Kevin Dillon's mm-hmm. character at the end. Yeah. So it's not just a complete, you know, by the numbers movie where the female's like, no, yeah, she was, she was never, I never watched a movie and felt at any point that she was helpless. She always yeah. felt pretty on top of everything and more of, yeah. more of the she aggressive. Was, yeah, or, she, yeah. she was trying to get him to help her, yeah. um, take care of this in the diner. Yeah. Then yeah. she goes after her little brother and friend in the theater. Yeah. Like she's very much plays an active role, yeah. which is that's great. What, that's what I like about her character. She was never some helpless character she that needed the most competent. Yeah. Character she was the, the most movie. competent. Yeah. And, and two, we saw that, just before this that apparently there's a i guess possibly in production or pre-production uh the remake another remake of it with <laughs> samuel L. jackson and i think the director of like the first tomb raider maybe yeah, um, yeah but you know from the time when the blob came out and then and then the remake in 88 that was 30 years well it's almost been 30 years again yeah. since that one so it's like you know, there's more that could be said if they want to, or there's I, I been guess, enough time. Like my biggest fear with the remake, this I was like some CGI blob. That that's why I don't <laughs> want it is because like the scenes where like you have just the practical effects and looks at the guy, like those are so awesome and amazing, and they still hold. Well, it's some just amazing the seeing the blob feel like it is a force and it like moves. Yeah, it's like I don't even know how they yeah. did that. You know, and, versus... and I think that's what. And some of it was obviously stop animation toward the yeah. end, but I still I would prefer crappy stop animation any day of the week over. Well, I think super that big I think that a you know a movie where they shoot or shitty they CGI. shoot it practically and use like that, but use better modern computer technology to composite the scenes better and not that. have the terrible mats and stuff. Yeah. But that that gives like, it a little bit of charm from the well, 80s, you know. But I think that the problem with this type of movie is that in today's age, like, 
I can definitely see like a sci-fi TV remake of this movie and it's just yeah. a terrible like CG blob and but you know like so the you know this movie the 1988 blob um like I said like it came out as kind of like a flop and nobody you know like had mixed critical reaction and it's not anything that I see a huge groundswell of support for these days but I still think you know it's a decent enough movie um you know, like I always talk about, like, oh, would I would I break this out at a party or have people over? Would I break it out and show a bunch of people? I don't think there's a lot here to really keep everyone's interest because, you know, as Derek said, it's kind of front loaded with some of the memorable gore. Yeah. And then it kind of kicks in at the very end. Yeah. But there's a section where there's not a lot that happens. And, you know, like aside from the main character of Meg, you really don't connect with too many other people. Yeah. And then but this movie does have the balls to brutally kill a child because one of the the boys that she's trying to rescue gets yeah, taken by the blob and good. then he's like partially skeletal when he's like coming out of the sewer water yeah. so that was a pretty like, cool song like lurching at her out of the water yeah like which is you know, a lot of movies don't do that the, uh, the setting I watched is saying you know you talk about not getting out at parties and stuff but uh, my grandparents about maybe ten years ago or so uh, a friend of theirs he uh, had a, like a really nice projector and everything he loved kind of show he loved he loves films he's he's super into them they built a giant uh, projector screen and hung it up in their garage and would have like 50 people over or more so i think they did a double feature of the original blob and then this blob and that in that context is kind of fun to watch yeah. you know um but again that i remembered all the gore scenes from this like yeah i think that's my biggest draw of this movie is like i love good gore scenes and this one did have some very good ones in it uh, it's and, worth watching too. Like, yeah. I, if it was a bad movie, I would say just go on YouTube and try to find those scenes. Yeah. But it's like free on Crackle. I think it's worth watching if you haven't seen it yeah. or if you haven't watched it in a while. But it, yeah, it has a lull about halfway through, mm-hmm. kind of towards the end. But um, you know, just I don't know. It just kind of lose some of its spark. Yeah. But one thing I too I really liked is it took a dig a little bit at like the Friday Thirteenth movies because even in yeah, the, the movie, like the faux movie, the, the, the movie. faux movie, yeah. that like they're sitting there and it's the movie the kids are at and it's like number eight of the series or something and the guy's like why is he trimming the hedges at eight o'clock at night he must be some type of pervert and it's like <laughs> and hockey season's not even going on right now and he has yeah. like a hockey mask on i love that dig they took with those well movies. then like when the, when the young boys are watching he's like check out the blonde so they yeah. make fun of the fact that those movies are just about watching the death count and yeah. the, yeah. the girls so i always find that a little bit interesting that they kind of took a dig and at this that. is a you know quote unquote better movie than Friday. Like it aspires oh, yeah. to be a better movie than those because it has the government conspiracy mm-hmm. angle. Like it, there's it's a lot more going life. on. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Yeah. It's not perfectly structured. Yeah, a tiny bit well. of social commentary. But there's, what it is. Yeah. There was a lot going on in this film, yeah. at least an attempt to, Oh, you know, one um, of the good running jokes was early in the movie. Uh, they're getting condoms at the convenience store yes. or whatever. And uh, the guy buys condoms and, and his buddy sets it up because a priest shows up or something. And they're talking to him, whereas other guys getting him. Well, the guy goes on a date with Meg and it turns out like her dad's the guy they bought condoms from. Yeah, the pharmacy. He's like ribbed when he talks. <laughs> yeah, he's like, do you want he's like, give me some Trojans. Do you want the he's like the regular or the ribbed? He's yeah. like ribbed. Yeah. So then when he's going out, the he, the um, was his name goes to pick up the Shawnee Smith character. And he meets her dad, and then like he never met the dad. His buddy's yeah. on the bottom, so he looks at him. He's like ribbed. Yeah, like that was <laughs> his just, buddy. Like, kind of sells him out as yeah. that he's the one that needs him because yeah, a, a priest. Because yeah. a priest walks up, and yeah. you know, yeah. Which the priest kind of plays a major role in yeah, the movie I mean, I a like, little bit. I like yeah. the end of it where yeah, uh, it kind of you know he collects I guess the spores almost yeah, like from the, yeah spores, the fr- where he gets and frozen. then he turns into kind of this radical. Because uh, he gets caught on fire, preacher. right? Is, does he get burned by the blob or is it burned by fire? I think it's fire because Meg puts him out. Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah, and then so basically he's he's one of those preachers that you know kind of has a tent <laughs> that's kind of thinking yeah. the end of the world's coming. Yeah. Um, almost like a snake a snake charmer tree, uh, <laughs> uh, preacher, but you know he has that blob, and it's yeah. like a perfect setup for a sequel. Yeah, it would be phenomenal if if this new one kind of. Kind of, yeah, it could, yeah. You, you really could. This feed new off one of talked it. about the radicalization of certain uh, religions and the harm of when people take it too far. Yeah. Like they could totally use that as a jumping off point and say something else. Yeah. Not that they need to say too much about this film. But I completely forgot about that. You could definitely tie this one into the last one because, you know. And you don't even, like, you could use that as a jumping off point and not even really have to tie it back to any of the characters. No, from yeah, this yeah, one. yeah. No, you yeah, could yeah, just yeah. Have because it. this movie, like we said, was kind of a flop. So you don't really make 
Plus, it's three years later, and a lot of the actors and actresses in movies are not like. It would be funny to have a uh, name to draw them back. Kevin Dillon to yeah. be back in. It's like Johnny Drama from Entourage. <laughs> yeah. but Johnny like, Smith, who was in Saul's one through three or whatever. I She's like, great. Yeah, I liked her a lot. I just kind of feel like this is one of those movies, going back and watching it, that kind of falls in a bad. It just kind of gets forgotten a little bit, you know, because you don't see many people talk about it. And you go watch like top 100s and. This one, I don't think is almost well, ever in like any of them. Watching this, it came out in 88, so it was a number of years after The Thing. But mm-hmm. I, f- I feel like The Thing had to have had an influence on how they wanted to do some of the effects. Yeah. yeah. Maybe not, but just maybe just coincidental. General, because it, but just like some of the effects, it looks like, you know, kind of the, um, for the 80s, deemed, you know, too gruesome like effects mm-hmm. that when you show it to a modern audience, they're like, oh, it looks too fake because it's rubber. Yeah. But I feel like even if the they, the people behind it didn't have any, you know, influence by The Thing... Like, to me, I just felt like, oh, it's kind of like post-thing effects on that type of, you know, grotesque type thing. It felt like that same wheelhouse. I just think that, you know, the thing was framed by a much tighter narrative. As I feel like this was a little bit, you know, it sagged a little bit more. And you really didn't get invested in any of the characters as much. And, you know, the tone kind of, you know, changed a little bit throughout. Because there was some comedy to some of it. It 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 very much felt like it was... A, a more of a self-aware remake of yeah. a 50s film like oh yeah. you know we're going to take this 50 films we're going to make it like an 80s version but still kind of keep that 50s vibe a little said, bit. If, you, if you told me the movie is in the 50s just the way that everybody was yes. dressed and yeah. they acted like even like the car Meg drove was like a beetle so yes. that could have yeah. been very much from the 50s but I doubt, you know like yeah yeah i mean I, I could see how and everybody in town was at the football the high school football yes. game because you know, the you know the cynicism of the 80s could be, you know, would be a good time to reflect the optimism and, you know, the great time of America and how it was so perfect 50s, in the yeah. 50s. Man. Make you, America great again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it's just one of those movies I feel that kind of just maybe gets lost by other movies of the time or maybe. Because, you know, like you said, you really don't hear that much about it ever. You yeah. Know? yeah. You, you, you don't hear too much about it because I think when people think of the blob, it's just kind of this ubiquitous, like, oh, it's a blob that consumes people. Well, I think the name of the blob is kind of an effective way for the way people feel about it. You talk like the blob. Yeah. You right. know, like, it's not like, I'm going to go watch this. I think the reason why, like, you know, it has some recognizable faces, but no stars. That, it has, yeah. um, you know, all their budget obviously went into effects and things like that. And like you said, it was like a kind of a, for the time, modern take on this movie from the 50s when you know, it was a much different landscape for film and America in general. And I just think that, you know, there was no huge hook that made it. Like, when I watched this, if I would never knew anything about the history of it, I'm like, this probably wasn't a big hit. And it wasn't because it felt very much like a niche genre film yeah. that was a remake of a film that had a big cultural impact. And it just failed to have that impact because of, you know, it just didn't have anything, you know, that elevated it. But you know, like enjoyable enough. Like, you know, we said that you can watch it for free on crackle. Um, cause I looked online. We always look to see if we don't have physical copies of it, what's the easiest way to watch it. And it was on the streaming services, but it was on crackle for free and it wasn't for rent on a lot of the services either. So yeah, the only thing I found to rent was most of the time I rent stuff. I use Microsoft video cause of Xbox and it was on there, but it wasn't like on any of the other stuff I have. So it's kind of weird that it was on that, but, but you know, it's one of those things where if you haven't watched in a long time, you know, I would still recommend checking it out. It's just, it's nothing earth shattering or... But the gore is very good. The gore is good. And like I said, if, you, if you've if you never seen it and you like the practical effects of the thing, you not that like they're this. similar, it's similar wheelhouse I, in yeah, terms it of definitely the, felt the like, look. It definitely felt like a sister film as far as the yeah. effects goes, the approach to them, like it was like, we're talking about. Because it wasn't like, it was grotesque gore. It wasn't like goofy, like somebody gets stabbed. And it, was, it was just like very grotesque. It, it was it's, it's a movie it, that sticks with it you. It looked like a... Like a Granted, the blob is a very unrealistic thing, but it looked yeah. realistic yeah. in that fashion of like, what would actually happen. Yeah. Not to over stylized, well, like, just yeah. like because some of the stuff you see that happen to the people, like it doesn't look like super fake. It's not like so like oh god, that's it. it it's still because this with the practical effects hold up because it's not terrible looking, you know. But, um, and I think it's somewhat. I mean, I have to go back. I mean, because I just watched it Saturday night, but I almost have to go back and rewatch it. But some of the stuff doesn't seem as because like the thing is almost so grotesque that it's like obviously not real like you said even y'all watch it in theaters you had some people kind of chuckling yeah. to be yeah. fair we so, didn't watch this in theaters in the 80s we yeah. saw they, they screened it oh, recently at a local it, yeah. theater <laughs> yeah. with a crowd that mostly hadn't seen it well before. none of us were alive in 1980 or 81 when the thing came out so we couldn't have watched it but 
Like it was it wasn't eighty two. Eighty two. Same, same year. Same year as ET. Yeah. But either way, you know, like I don't know if this, I would be interested to see what type of reaction this would get in a theater with some of the gore, because some of it later on, which obviously is not very good looking, but like just the beginning well, stuff. Well, too, I think with this, I don't think it has the reputation to to fill a midnight screening. Yeah, I don't. I don't think unless yeah. it was paired with something else that was like like yeah, I said, this and the stuff might be a good double feature, just because yeah. you know it's a movie from the eighties where a substance kills people, but. So I guess we can and kind I of. I think you have this first, and then the stuff, because this film you would start falling asleep towards the end of it. Yeah, you know? like there is a, yeah. As much as I enjoy it, it's a good solid film. But like they said, if I had a bunch of people over and I was going to screw like show a movie, I don't know if I'd pick this because outside of like the beginning, the end, as far as gore and just overall plot, it it's, it's kind of boring. It's not so bad. It's good, and it's not so great. You have to watch. Yeah. And so the it's acting's in the not bad. It, 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 it it's serviceable for what it is, but there's not enough draw for me to like like these characters. Like yeah, one thing they never really explained, or maybe they did, as forgot about it. Is like the beginning of the movie, the rebel dude, with the mullet kind of decides to jump a bridge with a motorcycle. And then it never really gets brought back up. Oh, yeah. He makes the jump later. Oh, he does? Okay. Yeah. He's I, like, trying to get away from yeah. the agents, and yeah. he makes it. So oh, it's okay. Because like, oh. his motorcycle started yeah. messing up when he tried it the first time, and then the homeless guy saw him. And, and then he's like, and, claps and laughs and, and took pours the, beer uh, out. Yeah, the beer yeah. can. But For me, I kind of drew some... I kept thinking about uh, uh, Junho Bong's The Host from 2006. Like That's one of my favorite monster films. But as far as kind of the, the government involvement and... Um, I don't know, just kind of, you know, these this everyday family kind of against it, or you know, people yeah. against against this big this big force. Um, but because I was thinking that, do you guys mind if we do that film next week? Is there anything else? The Conjuring's on the tenth, so we're gonna do the Conjuring that weekend. I mean, that's on Netflix too, so yeah. that's easy enough. Before I guess. it goes off, and two, I feel like it almost a parallel in some degree as yeah, far as fun, you know, um, kind of this thing going across the land and yeah. um, Blah. the government. <laughs> you know, dealing with it and then regular people and just kind of seeing how that film, this film handles it and that film. What would, um, what would have been a good twist? Not really, but like if the, every time the blob ate some money, be like blob, <laughs> blob. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be curious to see if they actually do the, that modern remake. It's, yeah, it's I, also the guy he directed Con Air and Expendables know. too. Could so, we get Nicolas Cage in it? Can Nicolas so that Cage gives you an idea of what you can expect. Con Air, hey, Con Air was good. You know. But that gives you, you know what you're going to expect well, from the Expendables yeah, and Con Air director. Yeah, you kind of think it's probably going to be more of a by the numbers right. um, Con Air like remake rather than top anything. Five American that, movie. Yeah, like, I don't even know what the approach that I would want to take with this. Somebody's like, here, go re- remake the blob. I would have to yeah. think a bit about that. I just kind of, yeah, it'd be hard to do. Because like, uh, that was more of a. You can't go wrong because there's not a huge following. So you're not going to piss like five people off. <laughs> you know? Like, oh, God, they changed the movie. It's like. Ruined in my five. childhood. They yeah. made a female version of the blob. Yeah, it's like the one of five people that would actually care, you know? Which is sad because I think the movie does have. It's not that it's, it, not that I care it that it's a female to, blob. Yeah. It's just that it's not as funny. It has, I think it has more to offer than Maniac Cop does, you know? Maniac but, Cop has an awesome premise that yeah. can be. When they, I think they, they, the today's the world. film itself yes we're, we're not i'm not talking about what it could be but yeah. what the actual what the actual end product is maniac cop just has a few more notable actors in it for that time because you have bruce campbell and everybody loves well not everybody but a majority of people love him and the other dude from halloween three the older guy i can't Tom remember his name. yeah, yeah like people like so you have those two people which draws you in a little bit more the blob doesn't have that and like i said it's kind of one of those 80 movies that's kind of forgettable but has it has a lot more to offer than maybe some of the later Friday the 13th and I don't know yes, do, other yeah. than the fact that it's not those movies. You know, like, I definitely think this was better than any Halloween after the third one, you know, but, well, the from the sixth, but. So, so I guess we can go ahead and wrap this up, if uh, unless there's any anything else we think needs to be brought up. And we're going to go back into the to X-Men, X-Men stuff after this, X-Men. so if you normally bow out when we start doing our plugs. Yeah, so unless that. there's anything else, like I said, I think it's, you know, it's you can watch it free on Crackle. I think if you haven't seen it, it's worth checking out. It's just, you know, it's not earth-shattering, and it's not, to me, a movie that I'm going to go back and revisit that often. Like, you know, like I said, it's competently done. It has some cool effects, but, you know, it's a little slow at points, and although there's a little bit of social messaging in there, it's nothing that makes it so... Um, it's not um, heavy-handed. No, it's, it's not heavy-handed. It's just a, a yeah. good plot. And there's just, like, 
my my thing on it too is we talk about this. There's just no no star was born out of this movie. Well, I mean, so I a think lot of these that, horror movies you don't have to have that. No, you don't. But a nothing lot of times, that pulls people in to yeah, watch it. But today. like which which I know this is a little bit different. But which Kevin Bacon movie or which movie was Kevin Bacon in the fright? First was, one. First, first one. one. So at least then like you, you you still have like it's interesting to see those people in this movie. But there's like. No real major actor in this, so I think some of that stuff kind well, of I think affects it a little bit. I think, it's some, I think for for its cult appeal or for its modern appeal, it doesn't have like see like um, leprechauns. Like watch one of Jennifer Aniston's first on screen yeah. roles. Yeah, but, but it's just kind of funny to watch it, like see what she start off in and see what she does. I now, just you know, like I said, I think it's a competently done movie that has some good aspects and has you know some nice updates to the idea of the blob. Hmm. Just nothing really rises above to make it a must watch. Yeah, at least yeah. watch the first half of it. <laughs> yeah. What? What? No. Actually, watch like the first thirty minutes and then watch like the last thirty minutes. Yeah. And just yeah. forget about a lot of the middle stuff. And but, then uh, it's pretty good. But, uh, those parts. But if you're enjoying the podcast, you can always do us a huge favor and go out to iTunes and leave a review if you listen to it there. Or if you don't, that's just an easy way to help us, you know, have people know what the podcast is about, help it be found and move up the rankings. So we'd appreciate that very much. Uh, Also, if you're listening on YouTube, you can always leave a comment or, you know, um, any feedback. You can also send us an email at podcast at housebythevideostore.com. And we will get emails from there if you have, you know, suggestions or anything you want to bring up that we didn't touch on in the podcast or corrections, you can send that there. And you can find all the work we're doing at housebyvideostore.com where there's links to all of our social media accounts. You know, the YouTube, Vimeo, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Vine. I think that's it. So you can find all that there. And to find us specifically on the Internet, you can find me on Twitter at Will underscore Droid. Uh, you can find me on most all platforms at MetaWorld Derek. And I'm at Blevins Sean on Twitter and at Sean2D2 on Instagram. So now we're going to move into some more in depth discussion on X Men Apocalypse. And in all fairness, uh, full, uh, oops, full spoilers. Yeah, spoilers yeah. now that we've already kind yeah, of talked about. Because, and honestly, I feel like there's. <laughs> well, if you don't care about the movie, I think just listen to the spoilers. So the, yeah. the movie. So, like, I want to go through the things that I think that were the biggest problems from my perspective is that, you know, when you have a movie that's like this big movie that's building t- towards a destructive, like, third act, that, you know, you have this new character introduced that's existed for centuries, and, you know, the opening prologue section is kind of how Apocalypse went into hibernation for, you know, thousands of years and how he disappeared, which, you know, like, to me, that was effective enough at mm-hmm. setting up, like, why he hasn't been there. And then it's kind of like him coming back and recruiting his four horsemen. And, you know, you get to see where, where Magneto's been. And then his entire motivation for getting involved in this is like after the, the Days of Future Pass, he kind of went into hiding and just tried to live a normal life, had a wife and a kid. And then someone sees him use his mutant power to try to save someone else and they recognize who he is. And then the cops take his daughter hostage. And then through an accident, she dies. So he kills all wife. of them. His daughter and his wife die. And, and two, about that scene real quick. So his daughter's upset because they're about to take her dad. So she's making these birds go crazy or whatever. Yeah, worst power ever. And I think that if they would have been in more danger and actually shot her on purpose, that would have been better because it's just like some klutz that lets his arrow go. And I think that's totally was the wrong way to handle that. Well, I mean, I think it it lost impact for me. And two, like, you know, you know, we can debate like all the effectiveness. It, It just set up like he tried to live a normal life and then people couldn't let it go. Which I liked all that. Like I said, that, that was the only small problem I had. And with then, that. Um, so then that kind of motivates him to be against humans. And then, like, that's why he, you know, goes with Apocalypse. And then you have, you know, the introduction of new X Men. You have Cyclops come in. You have Jean Grey. And you have some new, you know, new faces in addition to the old faces. But to me, like, one of the biggest problems with this movie that I had is, you know, we talked about, like, Derek said, like, Civil War, it's like too happy and has jokes and stuff. Like, I felt like Civil War weaved the humor more um, appropriately into the action. Because in this one, the best scene in the entire movie is Quicksilver saving everyone from the mansion before it explodes. I don't know. I mean, I, I To me, I that was the best That was the best scene in the movie was Quicksilver. Because um, Apocalypse comes, and then they knock out, they take Xavier with them. And then they teleport just as Havoc shoots a beam of energy, and it hits, like, the engine on the Blackbird they're building, and it blows the mansion up. Quicksilver shows up, rescues everyone from the mansion except for Havoc because he was so close to the explosion he didn't see him. And then, so you had this amazing scene that comes right after a climactic moment. And then at the very end, they're like, where's Havoc? He's like, oh, I thought I got everybody. And then he's just dead. 
And it's like, so you had the best kind of like comedic beat in the movie. That's un, like the overscores a dramatic death of well, a main character. But to be fair, though, like how many times you hear about somebody dying in real life and you're just like, oh, that's sad. I'm just thinking as a screenwriting thing, they could have structured that better because so it's, we a, it's an afterthought. Spider-Man no, again. it's an afterthought well, that they killed this character. That, well, I, that I, didn't bother me as much. But they've done that before. That is like in X-Men Last Day and then it's kind of like, oh, he killed Cyclops. Okay, mm. but in all fairness, I, I'm not trying to compare this to the Civil War crap and all that because I actually really love Civil War. At least they had the balls to kill people. Th- those movies, they, they are too afraid. Now, granted, Havoc's a minor character. He's been in all three of them. I didn't even know who he was. No, he's been in all of them. I he, fr- was, I, he was honestly, in like, First Class. Yeah. He was a, one of the major... I've seen those films, yeah. but only like once when each yeah, of them came out. In First Class, he's one of the original X-Men he had a, just a small bit role, you know, just kind of like, oh, hey, there he is in the Vietnam War and Days of Future Past. And this one, he was kind of like showing the ropes to his brother. Yeah. But like, like I said, it wasn't like he, like you said, he wasn't a huge character. It wasn't like you killed Jennifer Lawrence or you killed. I just, I just feel like the but, way that they did that was, like I said, it was just an odd framing of you go from dramatic, climactic battle scene to kind of lighthearted humor yeah. back to, oh, well, I guess that guy's dead. And yeah, then but, that's but realistically, somebody's... though, if the only person that knew him was Cyclops and a, a beast, you know, but well, like in... a more interesting way to do that could have been like him seeing, like going back in to make sure he didn't miss anybody, seeing him and trying to get to him, and he can't because he's already in the flames and has to get out or something, because otherwise it was just like, it was, to me it was just like, like I love that scene, but I was like, oh, I guess that guy's dead. That's your brother. Sorry, man. Yeah, then you're kind of but, and nobody but, but, cared. <laughs> but but like I said, most of the people that went there didn't know him. Yeah. So why would they all feel so terrible? If, I'm just saying, like Cyclops it, it had been there it. for like two or three days, and then his brother had been. Nobody knew who he was. He'd been gone. Well, like Xavier that. and uh, Mystique known him for twenty plus years. Yeah, but M- him years. And Mystique didn't really have the best. It, it was a kind of those things. No, I'm like, just saying that an I just don't get why you kill that character after a comedy scene. I, I understand why they killed the character to get more of a reason to Cyclops and to give his but to do character. it off screen to not even see it happen is be like a shrug like oh I guess yeah. he's dead yeah, maybe because I didn't care about the character even realize he was in the other ones much I was just like it didn't bother it didn't yeah, feel it didn't, weird to me yeah. I mean I but, liked but his one thing that but... I thought was weird was like when Magneto is about to kill all of his former co-workers yeah and Apocalypse comes in and he's like who the fuck are you yeah. like one that was like a little weird like it was trying to be funny and then he's like you're not gonna stop me from killing all these people and then he kills them like that was supposed to be funny, but I feel like that didn't play for me. See, I never really get that. To me, if I were Magneto, I feel like he should have been like, motherfucker, you just killed everybody. I was going to kill. You know, yeah, that's, like, that's, that's the problem I had with it. a joke, but yeah. it, like, it did not it, play. I'll agree that that, that felt like something that yeah. would have played differently in a like, Marvel movie with like Ultron or something. Yeah. Even yeah. That's Ultron why I said like great. in those movies, they have a better, and partially because on the, you know, Captain America Winter Soldier and Civil War, you have the, the Russo brothers directing it, and they came from community and Arrested Development from a comedy background. So I think they have a much better handle on how to integrate humor into the movies, as opposed to this one. If, like you said, like it was a, like when the theater we saw it, people actually did laugh when everyone dropped dead after Apocalypse killed them all. Mm-hmm. But it just felt like I think they had a weird juxtaposition of comedy beats and moments where it shouldn't have been comedy. Yeah, yeah. and I, I if they had better, that, if they had but... slightly altered those scenes, like I just said, like with the Quicksilver thing, is to me the best scene in the movie. Again, compared you know, like most people thought his scene was the best in Days of Future Past, but then they just kind of offhand like, "Oh yeah, well I guess you didn't save that guy; he's dead." But like, that, that was kinda, just a weird way to do it. But I would say this too, though: Quicksilver's character it wouldn't make any sense for him to have an emotional breakdown and start crying. No, he like, would. What no, the, he, all he, he said was, "I thought I got everybody." Yeah, like, I, he I, said, "Like I, th- I felt like that." Where I think you're way overreading that scene because no, I'm just saying to me when I watched it, it, to me it didn't fit. Like, it, like Quicksilver and, and didn't know the guy. Past, Magneto point out how they let everybody die, and they're like, "Oh, okay." But like, know, I'm like, saying, like Quicksilver, just, he would have known any. He would have known him to care. Yeah. But the point that I was just making was that it was just weird writing. To yeah. put that in the middle of that scene yeah. and then to come back at the end, it's like, oh, I guess he died anyway. Because you can have somebody, I don't know, I just felt that was a weird way to do it. I think he's reading into it too much. No, but it's just like this movie has a bunch of little nagging things like that. But every movie well, does. The, and, big, the biggest thing about it, so structurally, like it sets up, first of all, you're getting introduced to some X-Men. And then also the four horsemen are being recruited. But like the four horsemen literally don't do anything aside from being recruited and then waiting around to the end of the film. Yeah. Like 
I would much expect them to at least have a couple, like at least maybe one other battle with some X Men. Yeah. To kind of show off some powers to kind of set up the four horsemen characters, even like what their abilities were yeah. on a larger scale. Then towards the end, you would know, like, ooh, this person is dangerous because of this or this or this. Like, they did not build them up or even utilize them enough. Like, it was very flat. Like, well, they were all kind cool- of, they were all kind of young and inexperienced. You know, for the most part, well, like Psylocke and and Angel had done stuff before, but like Storm was kind of young and inexperienced. And then Magneto, like like another big problem I had the movie was, you know, so like Magneto is the horse when they're using like him, his magnetic powers to disrupt the world and destroy stuff. And, you know, they don't really show the human toll on screen, like, you know, at least in Civil War and the Marvel, you know, like the Avengers and Batman v Superman. They address the fact that a bunch of people have died. And this Magneto probably killed hundreds of thousands of people in Cairo, which is where most of this took place. So he probably killed a bunch of people there by using his powers and destroying these buildings and things. Actually, and then it started it was in Cairo. It was actually, and then, but then it started disrupting the entire yeah. world, and it could disrupt like the seismic. But in Cairo, the one that did all that was actually Apocalypse. No, Magneto, but then Magneto was doing all the stuff that had to have been Apoc- killing thousands yeah, but, or hundreds yeah, of thousands. Yeah, but that was people. more of a worldwide. Thing and then at the, the end of the movie, once Magneto changes mouth at the very end and starts attacking Apocalypse, then like all is forgiven, and he gets to go to the X Mansion, and Professor Xavier is like, "See you later, buddy." It's like even you know, even though he changed his mind, he still killed in the course and of this he's movie. Also already like done bad stuff in the past two movies you know but then that addresses the fact you know like not that this movie has touched on it at all and i haven't seen batman vs superman to know this but like maybe when people have the power to kill millions the fact they kill a few thousand doesn't matter if they make the right decision in the end i don't know how their morality works another thing about uh professor x and magneto is that even from that first x-men movie it was interesting like their relationship where they were at odds uh, as far as their ideology about like mutants yeah. and everything, but at the same, they respect each other, but at the same time, they weren't on, they weren't on the same wavelength and they yeah. kind of were against each other. First class did a good job introducing them kind of, you know, their dynamic, um, days of future past did that. Well, pretty well. Yeah. yeah. I and really then, enjoyed days. of Future. And past. this film though, it literally like they don't, aren't really together. Like this film on its own. I understand like some of these films, you've got to see some, see the ones before it, but they should have made this um, understood within the confines of this film. Like their relationship doesn't really hold any weight to it in this film. Like so much so to where at the end of the film, when Magneto like makes his change, they have to show flashbacks of the other films, yeah. like first, the first class <laughs> and the other one. And I feel like when was the last time you saw a, a franchise movie that did that? I think that was a very um, shorthanded um, solution to giving it any sort of emotional weight for, I feel like they made this film without that intent because that's just so that's a TV cheap thing to do. Well, they gave between, you know, to the central characters to this story are mystique and Magneto who get very little screen time. Like I said, Jennifer Lawrence's mystique is in the, the she's on the screen a lot, but she doesn't really say much. It's kind of the same well, thing. Rose with... Byrne is the most useless character in this movie. Yeah, she, is, she shows up in the beginning. She's an exposition dump. She doesn't have to really be there that much. I mean, granted, they find out more about what's going on. Yeah. And then she literally just hangs out with the X-Men, just says, wow, a couple times. And then Xavier is like, I kind of mind raped you and took away your memories of this entire event. I'll give it back to you now. And she's not really mad. Well, yeah. And, and like, and that was the only for that emotional beat for the end, like, it was just so, and like Cyclops, Psy- again, Psylops, like the Four Horsemen, there was so many people that were just there, and it was just wasting time. Like, there was not enough happening on like screen. To, like like you said, the Four Horsemen weren't really shown to be like a, a force to be reckoned yeah. with. And even in the flashback, the Four Horsemen like are able to save Apocalypse, but, you know, they didn't, oh, like, I, but then at the same time, like Apocalypse, you know, part of it's probably the structure of this movie and the budget his plan wasn't to go and terrify humanity and to attack them and then pull off his plan. His, his entire plan was just to set it all up, get everything ready and then go into it without letting anybody know that's happening first. Well, he wanted to also get Xavier's power because that way he couldn't be betrayed like he was. The he time can control before. everybody. Yeah. But there are some plot issues with this movie, but overall, like I well, think this is one of the movie, this is one of the excellent movies like days of future past that try to, Maybe I'm not saying it relies heavily on the comic book, but it tries to go more comic booky than the it's other. The most comic had. book, it's the most comic book like movie they've made so far. Oh, Days of Future Past kind of was. But I mean, too. I think this one goes even further because it has like the world destruction type yeah. stuff. But the thing I would argue is that you have all this build up, and then in the final battle, you know, which is theoretically the world at stake, the only people you really care for at all are like 
the few X-Men that you know already. You don't really have any like like even um like Spider-Man 2, the Sam Raimi one, like gave you stakes for like the city, you know, and like mm-hmm. you knew that people thousands of people are going to die. Well, they'd and already this, killed thousands of people. So the only people in that area were them. Well, no, this was going to, so. I'm just saying like in the X-Men, it's just like when you like the problem, I always kind of undercut this, what, what the stakes are set at because you're, there's well, no perspective on it. You're well, just, just watching action. It's just, out. it's just massive destruction yeah. of CG environments without a real physical, tangible human element to it. That show, a, show a mom and a kid in a car. Yeah. Show falling into the water in the bridge or something, like, you know, show, not even as, showing them just like almost on or, peril. As, or as they're battling at the same time, you have, you know, Jean Grey, and Quicksilver and all these people like trying to like oh there's a person falling from the building save them there's this but going on here again, yeah. that's been done so much and then but you to ignore get- it completely also it says you you just you've gone so far in just like heavy action mode that you're like what well, doesn't even address the real well, world and, concerns and I know you brought up the fact that Days of Future Past potentially like changed the timeline going forward I don't like as a casual like X Men fan just from watching the movies and you know watching the shows a little bit like I wasn't really thinking about that that changed those movies that came in the early 2000s for me i was thinking through the whole thing of this movie like okay well the world's not going to end these characters aren't going to die like so for me it was like i was just waiting for something significant to happen and there was no there was no good characters to get attached to like there was no interesting dynamic between magneto or xavier um it introduced uh cyclops and and gene gray gene gray was okay she wasn't anything great like she did a good job but uh but cyclops like First, he's in school, and he's almost seemed like he's somebody that gets picked on, but maybe he gets under trouble a little bit. Then he's in um, Professor Xavier's school, and then he's suddenly like a badass, like, hey, let's go to the mall. Man. Like None of his, his character did not feel well-developed to me, and he did not feel like a real character. But like, I, I they, feel they like, picked too, a good though, actor for that I think, role. I think yeah, I think it was the writing. And, yeah. and, but I think, too, though, like this movie, I think they had too many like i liked he, he they, wasn't they, brian they, singer was not able to manage this yeah stuff. i think yeah, it was much of an ensemble what, the funny yeah. thing is oh brian brian singer's the one that opened the door for a superhero movies to have a large cast what and he, he was did. very good at doing it for a long time but i think in this movie they got too ambitious for what they were and they have all do. the baggage of the other films yeah. now well, and, the thing that they did that was the problem so compare this to x2 which i said before was like one of my favorite x-men movies that one was the story where that could potentially kill all mutants or kill humans. Yeah. But the story was kind of centered through Wolverine and mm-hmm. that you had like a viewpoint going into mm-hmm. this. So this movie, had they just said, OK, Mystique is our viewpoint character and you see the story because they try to do that, but they didn't give her nearly as much to do in this as Wolverine had to do in, you know, X2. So I think if they had centered it more on one character... And that may have given shorter shrift to some of the new people, but they didn't do much of them anyway. Yeah, yeah. So if you had, it was unsatisfying, or, or maybe or maybe your main character is uh, Jean Grey, and you let her be the anchor point for this movie, and then you know you see things more from her perspective. Because as it is, it kind of just jumps between people. Yeah, but well, it, it started like, out with Cyclops. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm gonna see. You know, I'm gonna follow along, and they're gonna kind of because he build becomes him the leader up. of the X Men, and then they kind of. But as far as his characterization yeah. goes, they kind of let that go to the wayside and just have him some blanket dialogue that gets the scenes from point A to B and that's it. He's not building, building up his character. It's just like, everybody knows who X-Men are. Yeah. So this is the X-Men. But for me, I want to be invested in the characters on a movie by movie basis and not just based on what's come before, what's in the comics, anything. Yeah. But I kind of feel like they've set the groundwork for that in the next one, because now in the next one, you know, you may not have Jennifer Lawrence and you may not have Michael Fassbender in it. You might have more of the younger cast and you could focus more on them and kind of narrow it down a little like, bit. Like, I think, just like at the end of the day, I still think it was an enjoyable summer I think action movie. That it I got just think that. dumped on way too well, no, hard. So, I think what happened is that. By a lot of people. No, I think part of what happened is. <laughs> no. You're going to disagree with this. So, you had, like I said, so first class was a huge and an exponential improvement in quality from X Men Origins Wolverine mm-hmm. and The Last Stand, which kind of killed the franchise. So, they did this like soft reboot with first class and they brought in james mcavoy michael fassbender jennifer lawrence and then you know um nicholas holt and kind of relaunched it with that core cast days of future past was like okay so the first one only made 150 million dollars domestic we need to get hugh jackman back in this to make some money let's get some of the original cast and do a crossover time story or time travel story let's go a little bit more comic booky than we had before and there were stakes because it was time travel you knew it could at that in that film alone it could alter some things so it was like okay I feel something. So you had that, and then you had like a movie that was, you know, a good summer blockbuster that started making, made a lot more money in the first class and kind of got them back into the discussion of like these top franchises. 
And then I think everybody expected there to be another jump from Days of Future Past to Apocalypse in terms of like, you know, enjoyment and quality like there was from if you go from Captain America or the first Captain America to Avengers, Man. there's a huge jump in like quality of action and like ensemble cast. And like, you know, so they expected another jump like that when you're going to the Apocalypse, which is like a world altering story. And then it was just an OK movie. And I think that's what caused a lot of the frustration and the fact that it's Brian Singer who's been behind all these prior I, movies. I still think, I mean, me personally, I really enjoyed it. I've This is the one I've enjoyed the most this year as far as it's come out. But I think we've all, I think what's happened a lot too, though, is these X-Men movies have not been, like this was a movie that probably pushed the boundaries while it was acceptable for PG-13. Oh, all of them blood have. in it. It uh, had, not a, every had an F bomb. It had some. Had a GD. Yeah. Because um, like uh, Days of Future Past, very little. There was no blood in it at all. Even Wolverine, the very few scenes he did use his claws, no blood. Well, they're mostly bone claws, so they weren't really effective. But it doesn't mean that you can't save somebody. But this one, but this blood. one, like the Weapon X scene with Wolverine in which, this one, was pretty. I, I was. I thought it was pretty awesome. I thought it was. It was more well done than X Men Origins Wolverine, which was just mm-hmm. a terrible movie. But in the context, you know, like the storylines it didn't make much sense because theoretic so in <laughs> these movies timelines are such a mess well, like i but said you, you kind of gotta i know that you take the time the, travel wipe yeah, it all away but at the same time <laughs> at the same time i don't think that excuses inconsistent storytelling in that so at the end of days of future past he had the bone claws and he was in the bottom of the river and they fished him out but it was mystique posing as striker who rescued him so theoretically she freed him and he went off and did his own thing in this movie striker 10 years later was able to track him down and get him into Weapon X program. Even though the future been, even though the past had been changed, he still got brought into Weapon X, which I thought that they would have written that out. So they put him through Weapon X but, uh, 10 years later, and then X-Men Origins Wolverine took place in the late 70s. So this is like four years after, or four or five years after it would have happened in that timeline. What about the Wolverine? When did that take place? Between the Wolverine took place in like the future, right before... It took place between... X Men Three and Days of Future and Pass. Days of Future Past because mm-hmm. it's at the very end Magneto and Professor X show up, mm. so so like that timeline I guess could still theory it's just like I get why they put Wolverine in that role because they wanted to have him involved and not be a central character that took away from the cast of McAvoy, Jennifer Lawrence, and Mac, uh, Fassbender, but I think they could have make him one of the Horsemen. Because I thought he had the bone claws, so if you make him be one of the horsemen who gets imbued with like the animanium skeleton by Apocalypse, and then you have him have like a smaller role, like that would make, especially if it's at a point in his life where like he has, I don't know. I just think they could have found a better way well, to work him into. The, I mean, that the what they did with him was awesome, but in terms of the the story of these movies and the timelines, it makes absolutely in the no confines sense. of the story. I agree, but if well, they the, probably want to try to build these other characters since he's getting out yeah, after you know what I mean. I understand like every, leaning on him. Again. Every post scene from everything I read from the directors and everybody involved in the film, if anybody is familiar with like, I can't think of the name of the X Men cartoon movies in the mid two thousands ran WB. I was in their high school. Uh, essentially like a first class type yeah, thing. They yeah, they had a character called X-23, which is like Wolverine's daughter slash clone. And everything kind of points to while they're getting rid of Hugh Jackman to have that character come in and fill the void of Wolverine for a few years. Well, then isn't there the new comic that's the new Wolverine yeah, and that's that, a female? That's, well, Wolverine yeah, is technically dead, I think, in the comics. Mm, no, he's dead. Mm, he's dead right now. Yeah, but it's a comic, so take it. But then also, is. yeah. But, but, but anyway, my entire point is that this entire <laughs> like end of that movie is probably trying to set up that character. So but I the understand thing, them putting him in the, the movie problem. I have like so it I, wouldn't make any if the Weapon X program doesn't happen. Deadpool doesn't happen because Deadpool. Well, Weapon Deadpool, X. but the Deadpool was Weapon X. It was something else. No, it's called Weapon X in the Deadpool movie. They, it was, well, they it was not ran by the same people. It was, but it was still an offshoot of the weapon. But see, that's program. the problem you get into these, uh, these, these but time Deadpool travel stories. Even references, you know, a lot of that stuff. Well, time travel is like which professor is it? Xavier or is it um, uh, Patrick McAvoy, Stewart or yeah. McAvoy? I always get these timelines screwed but, up. Well, again, I, I think they need they've they've been doing this. This is the longest running superhero franchise. Uh, Almost by it, accident, though. It, you know, than any other one. Superhero films have changed so much since that first one started. Like the actors have kind of played their course and some of them are getting older now like i think now because superhero films have changed again spider-man has like a normal looking costume like from the yeah. 60s and it, like they can do a lot to refresh this yeah. franchise which like, i think that they can maybe do that do. 90s one and the x I, the Wolverine, I think, yeah and then get done and take a little break and then just kind of you know be the next generation of superhero films um and just 
go at it from there. Like, well, I, I would guess, like to see a partnership with with Marvel and Disney, yeah, and like they're not going to do that. And, and <laughs> you know, Fox be like, hey, you know, you give us this much of the profits, and well, the the only and, way that Fox will cut the same deal with Disney and Marvel that they that Sony did with Spider Man is if a more like if this movie ends up like say drops more dramatically than they thought and ends up making almost nothing and like the fantastic four flopped and they've yeah, already canceled that sequel so like if one more movie in that stable flops then they might consider partnering with them but they've already gone so far down the road like you said of this time travel stuff that it would make no sense for that universe to exist in the same timeline as the avengers yeah. so to wipe the slate clean yeah and they've well, invested so much in building all this stuff up i don't think they would and, even attempt to do that let me say this i'm gonna preface this comment with i really love civil war i thought it was great um I definitely like the better Age of Ultron. You all know my issues with that. Do I think that this movie is better than Age of Ultron? Yes, I enjoyed it more than that. Because uh, Age of Ultron, Tony Stark was personally responsible for killing like a ton of people, and that's kind of poo pooed. Like in real life, like even in Civil War, he's still showing no accountability. Like, nobody actually. Well, no, in Civil War, Stark he takes for. accountability, but in, he should be in prison and arrested in a jail. Well, at the same and time, there's a di- there's rich. a difference though if you create no, an AI but, that goes evil versus but if it's still you- his fault. It's still his own fault that those people died, and that happened. But, but it anyway, wasn't like he was personally doing it. I, yeah, he kind of did. But anyway, in that movie, I'm, I'm not going to try doing spoilers with this. I just think that we've all, a lot of the general movie-going audience has shifted over to the Avengers style because you have a lot more big-name actors, and it's just it's a movie that is just meant to lift you up and I mean, you know, I think give you a handshake and give you, you know, throw that, your money. These in. X-Men films now, they don't have the... They don't have the actors in there like those Avengers movies and all the Marvel ones that have like the charisma to kind of pull people into theaters. People love Jennifer Lawrence, but she's kind of, I mean, she's been criticized for this and I thought she did a fine job. She just are, didn't. People are criticizing yeah. kind of her performance. The, I thought she did fine. The thing actually. I'll say on this though is, you know, like independent, like I didn't compare, I didn't go in thinking compared to civil war. Like I love the X-Men movies, like, cause that was one of the first, you know, like X-Men, like I said, if you watch it now, it's kind of quaint and kind of boring, but you know, I still enjoyed it at the time a lot and I still think it was very important. I loved X2. You know, like I think that, you know, Hugh Jackman, when people go over his height, like he was a great Wolverine is, you know, synonymous with that character. He's a now. staple. That's like his. So those role. movies, I don't go in saying like, oh, I'm comparing these to yeah. Civil War and all this stuff. But I, I just thought that as, it, as compared weird. compared to Days of Future Past and compared to X2, this movie had some good stuff. And I still think it's an enjoyable action film. I just think it lacked anything that made it more than just an enjoyable action. Well, film. They need. Yeah. They need something to pull people into theaters again. You know, like Robert Downey Jr. He's a huge draw. Like they yeah. don't have anybody like that in this film. But at least for me. Like I like superhero yeah. films okay, and I like the X Men films. I've seen them all, but at the same time, there was nothing in the trailers for this that had me really excited. I was excited that it was Brian Singer again, and Days of Future Past was pretty good. I'm like, yeah, okay, really enjoyed Brian Days Singer, you know, Usual Suspects. Like he he can make a good film. I'm excited to see what he's gonna do. But uh, not only did none of the performances really shine, uh, the characters, even you know the characters, it wasn't not necessarily the actors, but one they don't have people to pull people into the seats, and two. With what they do have, they don't do much with it. Like at but the it, end of the film, it says this film is responsible for 150,000 jobs and all that. Did you see that? Yeah. And I was thinking they couldn't go sit down with the script and flesh out some of this dialogue and these characters, well, and they're putting 150,000 well, like 150,000 people to like work. One of the last things I'll say before we ramp this up because this room that we're shooting is actually getting really hot now. But um, at the end, like we said, they had, they had like the post credit stinger, and I get that in some of these movies that they're kind of you know vague and you know exactly what it means. But being somebody that, you know, watched the 90s animated series, read a bunch of comics in the 90s, has watched all these movies, that end stinger, I had no idea what that meant. Yeah, I mean, I was like, I had to go look it up online. At least in some of these other movies where they have like post credit stingers, you at least get some idea of what it's supposed to be. And I think that, you know, like, like, you know, the last one after Days of Future Past, I got that it was Apocalypse because I knew that that was what they had talked about. But this one, I had no idea what it was. I had to go look it up afterwards. And I think that's just part of their failure. It just shows like they didn't think all this stuff through. I don't know if that's how they don't thought of it through. Because just showing this out of context thing where you have no idea what it means, that's not good storytelling. And for me, like I said, when I felt I was getting like an X-Men 3 vibe, I felt like it was as much of a mess as X-Men 3. Like they have some good things they could have done there, but it almost felt like it was rushed or just kind of thrown together. And it, yeah, again, well, things that, weren't thought I out. I think this one was slightly underbaked as opposed to I thought Last Stand was just ruined. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is still yeah, enjoyable I think underbaked and good is, enough is movie. A, is a good way to like, put this I don't this know. One. Like I said, my opinions are obviously very way from William and Sean's. I really liked it. It was one of my favorites of the year, if not my favorite of the year I mean, so far. I still enjoyed it, but... Uh, I just think that what hurt this movie a lot, too, is that I think if it didn't launch in the same month as 
Civil War. I think that you would have had seen if it had a little well, bit more it, time. It only had little, like four weeks to distance itself from that movie, well, and it that suffered movie a little. Still very popular. I think it suffered a little from comic fatigue because you had Deadpool, then Batman versus Superman, which then Batman versus Superman everybody dumped on too. But it's also like I haven't you know, seen it yet. Yeah, but so you can't. Zach, but a Zack Snyder film. Mm. He's never had a film that came out and people kind of universally loved it that I can remember. Well, no. That film at least had something new and exciting to deliver every scene. Like there was no. some crazy stuff happening or something like interesting. This film just kind of went along slowly. I mean, like, I was ex- I was wanting to see some of the 80s stuff. Like no. I would have liked to see some more time in the mall with them being characters and being teenagers. No, that, and like it just yeah. felt there, like was, there was nothing there. Well, there was like, a bunch of that stuff that they didn't put in the movie. There was like and uh because like even like yeah. reference Dazzler in the in there and they didn't. Right. But. So, so I think we've discussed the uh, X Men Apocalypse enough for this episode. Yeah. Unless there's anything else we absolutely have to say. No, I don't right. think so. Right. So I think no. uh, that Thanks will be for listening. it. So that'll bring this episode of the House by Vegasaur podcast to a close. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.